Hi again. So I cannot hear it. Am I the only one? Oh wait, sorry, I wasn't I wasn't mute. What about now? Okay. No signal. Um you cannot hear it. Okay, give me a second. Uh, I'm supposed to be sharing the audio here. Now. Cannot hear yet. Oh, uh, we still cannot hear. And still no, wait, but this is supposed to be working. Um, so give me another second then. Um, okay, so what we could do is, um, is Jack here? Yeah. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna move a Felix presentation to the second one. Wait, but is everybody here? Uh, because what we could do is, if we do that, then we can find a solution in the meantime. But the second presenter is not here. <laughs> Give me a second. Um, can you invite them from, from uh, this meeting? Sorry, what? Uh, you can just invite them using the contacts. Uh, email address, I think. Sorry, say that again. You can invite them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually sent the email earlier, and uh, oh, really, okay. Um, yeah, I think I think so. The only person is missing now is uh, Dolphin, Mister Mister Lu. Uh, but uh, I can contact him personally. So just wait a little yeah. bit. Uh, Jim Harris. Yes. I think Ali asked. Ask if you can share the uh, Zoom link. Oh, okay, okay, I'll send that. Sorry, I didn't. So you can, can post it on the uh, BTR website. Okay, so. Uh, oh, wait, let me. And here we go. Um, okay, so I sent it to Eli and I sent it to Mr. Yukun Fang, we still, ah, you're already here, okay. So we are all here now, so now all we need to do is to find a way to show uh, the audio, uh, which I tried using the, what, what Jack suggested. So um, let's just move Felix's presentation to a little bit later. And Jack, if, if you don't mind me asking, can you try to find a way to how to do it? And then just let me know on chat, and then we, I will try after this after the pres this presentation. Yes, yes, I'm looking it up. Okay, so it's uh, Mr. Dixon Luo. Yes. Uh, so we have technical issues with the video. So can you can we move your presentation to the first place now? Because the second presenter is missing on action. Yeah, I see. Okay, so um, please share your screen. Okay. Oh, wait, let me stop here. I stopped sharing mine now. Can I see the screen? Um, yes. Uh, wait, give me a second. Uh, let me shut this down. Uh, I can, yes. So whenever you're ready, please go ahead. OK. Uh... Is it possible to turn your video on? Uh, yes, I'm trying. Wait, wait a minute. Do, 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 do video. Okay. Okay. So uh, shall we just start? Yes, it took a while, but let's get this going. Okay, so thank you so much for participating in today's uh, presentation. My name is Lee uh, Chen Luo, a PhD student from the University of Tokyo. 
Today, I'm going to present the study titled uh, Evaluating the Impact of Private Autonomous Vehicles on Activity-Based Accessibility in Japanese Regional Areas, a case study of Guma Prefecture. So the uh, basic background and assumption for this study is that uh, autonomous vehicles are expected to be operated in the near future. And the definition adopted in, the, uh, in this study is that a autonomous vehicle is an entire dynamic driving task without any expectation that a user will respond to a request. So the main feature of autonomous vehicle is that a human will see the controllability of vehicles to the robotics, following which there will be some uh, implications such as model shift and induced travels. So while there are uh, many there are many studies have been conducted in the US and Europe, this study intends to offer uh, insights in the context of Japan, where relatively fewer studies have been done uh, regarding this topic. So uh, the objective of this study is to evaluate the transport-related implications of autonomous autonomous vehicles uh, in the Japanese context, including the implications for mode choice, trip generation choice, trip destination choice, and activity-based accessibility. So to the best of our knowledge, this has been uh, considered in the existing literature in a limited manner. So, uh, and the one important characteristic of this study is that uh, a combined activity-based travel demand model and a dynamic traffic assignment travel uh, supply model is estimated and validated. And also some basic assumptions of this study include that like uh, only fully automated uh, autonomous private vehicles are considered and not include those shared autonomous vehicles. And the car sharing service is not assumed allowed. So each time one vehicle can only take one passenger. And uh, here I'm going to give a, a brief literature review. So the uh, topic of autonomous vehicle impacts have been extensively studied in the existing literature. So in terms of a basic feature, the value of the travel time or uh, the travel impedance, many have used several studies to uh, quantify the changes. So for example, Stack et al. in 2018 estimated that 31% reductions in value of travel time for PAV commuting trips and a 10% reduction for the shared time vehicles. But as the, the last line of this table shows that it is important to note that whether a time vehicle will reduce travel impedance is yet not uh, settled. And regarding the autonomous vehicles' impacts on travel behaviors, simulation studies were extensively used. So, for example, Vyas et al. in 2019 applied an activity based uh, travel demand model for the PAV scenarios and found like a 1 to 3% uh, increase of ac ac activities and 3 to 4 to 5% increase in total distance travel. While uh, much fewer can be found regarding the uh, uh, the, the autonomous vehicle impact on accessibility, but basically uh, from the turbo, from table I showed here, uh, accessibility gains were reported from the existing, existing literature for PAVs. While in the Japanese context, uh, most uh, academic works so far focus on the vehicle ownership and mode choice issues as shown in this table, and uh, studies on auto choice dimensions like the trip generations or accessibility have been uh, quite limited so far, if not missing from the, uh, to the best knowledge of the authors. And so the, ma the methodology framework adopted in, in this study is shown in this page, two features assumed for the tons of vehicles, so uh, less travel impedance and the, the availability for those unable to drive. Then the autonomous vehicle will be introduced into the short-term framework that has a new uh, mode of travel, the transport demand model and the supply model is formulated in a, back, a feedback way. So after which uh, travel demand and supply equilibrium would be uh, would be reached and a utility-based measure of accessibility called activity-based accessibility would be calculated. And specifically, uh, data activity schedule mod model uh, and maxim is are employed as the travel demand and the supply model respectively. So uh, the reason is for using these two models are stated at the right side of this slide. The study region uh, uh, is Guma Prefecture of Japan, uh, a landlocked prefecture in the capital region with its uh, prefectural government located approximately 100 kilometers away from the Tokyo station, which, are, which is shown by the straight line in the, in the, in the figure uh, of, of the right side of this uh, slide. And uh, according, to the, is, according to its most share, uh, the, we assume that the public transits are not considered in this modeling. 
And within this uh, study region, we used the 2015 Guma uh, person trip survey data as the initial travel demand and the match levels analysis of national census and uh, economic census as the land use data. The graph showing the right side illustrated the spatial uh, illustration of the number of households in the Guma PD data area to show basically where are the urban centers in this uh, study region. And as mentioned, an agent-based travel simulation model, uh, Massim is employed as the travel supply model. So Massim is, is designed as a integrated uh, travel demand supply model with an iterative loop. But in this study, only the network loading part is used. So specifically in the network loading, uh, the traffic flows are simulated in such a queue-based model. And a general uh, capacity factor of around 0.66 is applied to the road network data to reflect the delay effects from such as inter intersections. After the iterations con convergence, Maxim is a program to perform the shortest pass calculation to retrieve the congested travel impedance for each time of day period the topic in this study. And uh, Comparisons between the level of service generated from uh, Massim and the Google Distance Metrics ABI are done here to, uh, to, to validate the efficacy of the Massim. And uh, so we uh, randomly sampled five southern pairs uh, of uh, one kilometer mesh centered pairs, which are set at uh, this uh, original destination. And then uh, linear regressions are for the five times a day of this study are estimated, which are shown in this page. So the uh, slope coefficients of the linear regression models uh, from this from these graphs, we can tell that they suggest a good reproducibility for the travel time, and so do for the uh, travel distance. And for uh, travel demand models and activity-based travel demand model on the basis of the daily activity uh, schedule model is employed. So the main idea is that uh, the two decisions are and should be conditioned by, uh, as well as constrained by the uh, trip banker's activity pattern decision. So plus this model can model the generation of a sub tours and the intermediate trips in the trip level uh, decisions. So then I show you here some examples of the estimation results. Uh, in this page, the result of a mode destination model for the uh, work purpose tools are present pre presented. So we can tell that, for example, the coefficients of the travel time variables fall into an expected order as car, as car driver being the, less, uh, negative, the least negative one. And then the basic uh, uh, model settings are showing the right side, like the uh, destination sampling settings and uh, how we get uh, the impedance uh, Values from. And this page and also the three following pages show the estimation result for the daily activity pattern level, which is the highest level of this uh, DS model. So this level in predicts how would a trip maker arrange his or her activities and the travels in a six bit uh, form. So each bit refers to a occurrence of the two sort of stops of the of the three activity purpose categories that we adopted in this study. So for example, uh, 10001 means that at least one work purpose tool and along with at least one other purpose stop would be uh, performed by this uh, specific uh, trip baker. And the other variables from daily activity pattern levels such as uh, job categories and uh, also yeah, job categories and also lock some variables are showed here. We also did uh, the validation for the DS model in this study. So here I show you still some examples of the validation results uh, with, of the daily activity uh, pattern model, the number of the tools model, and the primary tool model. Uh, model. So all, all of them in, indicate a good reproducibility, allowing to use the model output for these levels in the subsequent analysis. But it seems not the case for the validation result for the uh, of, of home primary destination travel distance where the simulation basically tend to under predict those less than four kilometer uh, while over predicted those uh, maybe above six kilometer or six kilometer to like uh, 18 uh, kilometers. But still it is worth noted that it's the average uh, distance between home and primary uh, activity destination from the simulated results just slightly larger than the observed one. So from this perspective, the, this, the average distance value could be still used for the, uh, for the subsequent uh, predictions. 
The autonomous vehicle uh, scenario settings are introduced here in uh, in this page. So with the target, we assume the target year of the forecasting as of 2040, all the scenarios uh, uh, just are assumed to randomly decrease around 17% uh, populations decrease uh, to reflect the uh, population change uh, that were predicted by the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research of Japan. And uh, Four autonomous vehicle scenarios are proposed with different levels of valuable tra travel time and uh, road capacity improvement assumed. Again, the PAVs in this study assume they're always available for the members of PAV owning uh, households. So with the convergence, uh, converged uh, uh, simulation results, some insights on the autonomous vehicle implications in the short term can be gained. So we have several findings like uh, the increase of the considered in, uh, indicators values is higher in the scenarios two and four than in the scenarios one and three, which is uh, especially because of a uh, more optimistic uh, tunnels vehicle valuable travel time decreases assumed. Uh, while the difference among the scenarios with only road capacity changes seem much more uh, moderated, like you can compare with the scenario three and four. Uh, while the total number of tours and the trips do have, uh, sorry, uh, do have some moderate increases in all of the four uh, scenarios around the right uh, 2%, uh, but uh, the travel distance is demonstrated much larger changes uh, from 22% to the 44, around 44% uh, increase uh, found in the four scenarios. These are argued to be uh, caused by the changes in the trip destinations. And at the average speed, finally, in the central area of Guangma is found to uh, reduce in all autonomous vehicle scenarios. The magnitude of changes approximately double in these scenarios with more uh, optimistic value of travel time settings. And the benefits from the road capacity improved at the average speed by around 1.5%, which you can compare with uh, scenario four and two, suggesting that the supply side was uh, sensitive to the road was more sensitive to road road capacity changes, and uh, based on the convergence state, we also calculated the activity based accessibility, which have been uh, introduced before, and uh, also here they uh, we that uh, especially we can see you can see the equations showed here that from taking extracted from John et al in two thousand six, so. Uh, basically, we calculated from the accessibility or the lack some value from the top level of the uh, DS model, the, the, the daily activity pattern level. And uh, they are, uh, as a result, they are found on average and by media increase by around uh, two to three uh, minutes amount of study region in the, the talented vehicle scenarios. And it's also intuitive that the levels of the accessibility, the activity-based accessibilities are dependent on each individual's demographic uh, characteristics, like by the segment of employment status under, uh, for example, scenario four, which uh, the results show here, that we found the employment people benefit more than the unemployed. So it is because uh, argued, to be, argued to be because that the utility gains for the employed are limited to uh, the other purpose tools, while the employed people combine their gains from the multiple types of uh, tools. And to evaluate the spatial pattern of the changes in the activity-based uh, accessibility more clearly while controlling the effects of all the covariates, we estimated the acti activity-based accessibility for a representative individual who was replicated and assigned to reside on each mass cell. So we can we show you here the results like the change distribution of the accessibility by the uh, by residential locations are under scenario four. The left is the absolute level of the accessibilities, which you can find that the urban centers have a higher uh, travel accessibility compared to the obstacles as expected. And the right graph shows the difference values against the base scenario, which, however, shows that uh, the ABA gains are higher in the suburbs and the outskirts of this region. In fact, it's expected to be uh, to affect the future residential location uh, patterns. So, uh, to conclude, this study evaluated the potential impacts of the PAVs in the context of Japanese uh, regional areas and. Uh, uh, inter interacted, uh, inter integrated uh, travel forecasting approach that combines uh, activity-based uh, tra travel demand model and a dynamic traffic assignment model was estimated, validated, and simulated. And the first autonomous uh, vehicle scenarios were uh, 
uh, along with the baseline scenario, were assumed with different combinations of valuable travel time and the road capacity benefits of autonomous vehicles. The metrics in the four autonomous vehicle scenarios show similar changing patterns, but to different extents. So, for example, compared to base scenario, the total distance traveled in the autonomous vehicle scenarios are estimated to increase by around 22% to at the most 44%, while the average travel speed in the urban centers are estimated to increase, decrease by almost around 5%. Nevertheless, this study confirms that the uh, prevalence of PAV would have a positive effect on the average in terms of accessibility in the selected Japanese regional area. Average uh, activity-based accessibility were estimated to be around 2 to 3% equivalent to welfare in the ton of vehicle scenarios. And there are also some limitations applied to study and which also show some promising directions for the future uh, works. So firstly, first of all, not all expected changes in terms of vehicle characteristics are evaluated. For example, complex uh, vehicle behavior and the following personal uh, travel behavior adaptions such as the intra-household vehicle locations are not captured. And also uh, some limitations of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, DS models, uh, like uh, the uh, individual specific time budget uh, has not explicit, explicitly incorporated and the Luxem variable failed to reflect the changes from time of day and other other trip based uh, level choices and also the sampling ratio applied is in this study might not be very uh, might not be sufficient and that's for today's uh, presentation and uh, thank you and then any questions uh, would be welcome Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we don't have questions in this chat so far. So because we're not that many, I would like to just open the floor um, directly. So if you have any questions uh, regarding uh, this presentation, uh, please just un unmute and ask or raise your hand and then I respond to you. Okay, so ice break, as an icebreaker, let me just start then. Um, so thank you for your presentation. So I have a question regarding the, 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 st the state of the art, right? So there's a lot of similar studies that have been conducted uh, in, uh, dealing with a similar, uh, uh, setting their own assumptions. So what is the, the new findings regarding like, your, your, what findings are new or what findings are consistent with the previous studies that you want to highlight? Well, uh, for the simulation results, Basically, uh, wait a minute, sorry. Uh, the results are co actually consistent uh, with the uh, existing liter literature, like uh, the for the PV for the for the private autonomous vehicles, uh, uh, particularly that uh, travel distance would uh, have uh, uh, increased, but uh, to a very uncertain extent, you know, depending on the model settings that we applied. And also, yeah, the decrease of the average speeds and uh, and uh, even like the the positive gains from the uh, from the in, in terms of accessibility. But uh, what we found here is that uh, we confirm uh, we confirm that in the uh, PAV's case, uh, especially for these Japanese uh, regional areas, that the uh, the the the, the, the uh, we can still gain the in the in terms of accessibility a positive effect on uh, which as because the accessibility can you can think it as a composite evaluators to uh, to to assess if that uh, that this new mode of travel a time vehicle would uh, have a uh, you know like a positive or negative effects in general. So I think to the best knowledge of me of my uh, this one is the first to evaluate the activity-based accessibility in, in terms of, in, uh, I say, yeah, in terms of private autonomous vehicles. Okay. And I think you want to point out here that, because when you say, when you say research about Japan, people think, have the idea of very high density, very transit-oriented development, but this is the most, uh, the prefecture that has the highest car ownership ratio in Japan, right? So uh, it's not exactly your usual image of Japanese city. So Frederick is asking on, on the chat, so what are the following studies are you going to pursue with this model? Can you elaborate on that? Forest. Oh yeah, and uh, like uh, what we what I mentioned here that uh, this uh, this result this findings is a factor expected to affect the future residential location patterns. Actually, we are currently 
uh, conducting a study that to quantify how exactly the uh, residential location distribution would change following the these changes of accessibility in this uh, also in this uh, specific uh, regional area, and also is it is uh, as per your comments it is also important to note that Japan is uh, uh, because we uh, it, it is actually. Uh, uh, aging count, uh, aging society, and with also some uh, a very you know dra 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 uh, drastic. Uh, sorry, wait a minute. Uh, drastic with a drastic uh, population decrease, like uh, in two thousand forty, we assume basically predict there will be only eighty around. 82.45% of the uh, current population would stay. So uh, that, but so in under that case, we still actually uh, get some get the simulation result like the average speed in the central area uh, would re reduce. So I think that is also one original point in the from this study. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, there are no further questions and the time is up. So I would like to wrap it up here. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I think the next presentation is also math team based. So I think there's some room for discussion. Hopefully the, the gods of the internet will allow me to. So if you, Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Share the sound now. So give me a second. Um, uh, let's do share. Please, I don't have the option to, to, to share video. I have iPhone, iPad, whiteboard, and then Ah, oh, this one. Let's see. And then can you see the screen, the video? Yes, it's good. Okay, let's see if the audio works. No, we don't have any sound. You cannot hear it? No. It's weird. Um Okay, Jack, do you want to give it a try? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. I'll share my screen then. By all means. This is what I this is why I believe that the computers will never take over the world because in a critical moment, they are. <laughs> <laughs> can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, let's see if the audio works. Can you hear? Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. Start from the beginning. Thank you very much. Okay, Hello, sorry. everyone. I'm Chris Keller, and I'm here to speak about autonomous vehicles and cost-benefit analysis. I'm a PhD candidate at the Vedicom Institute, which works on the electrical and the autonomous vehicles. The work I'm going to present today is done in collaboration with Tariq Shwaki, Nicolas Coulombel, Jeff Berada, and Laurent Bouillot. So, the expected benefits and drawbacks of autonomous vehicles are numerous. Without spending too much time to review them all, let's go through the most expected ones. Car driver could gain in time or comfort during the travel. Transport operator could save a lot of money as the driver cost represents 30 to 40 percent of the operational cost. The autonomous car could also help to reduce emission through a smoother driving. However, if this mobility cost decreases, we could encounter rebound effects. And it could lead to an increase of our mobility consumption. So let's dive in, in the interesting research question that we have today. This presentation aims to answer to the two following questions. Are there more interesting AV services than other for urban territories? And do AVs could find a place among existing mode of transportation in urban areas? How do we evaluate a service which does not exist yet? For this simulation, we will use mobility simulation and the uh, use case of machine building. And how do we evaluate a service which has numerous socioeconomic impacts. Economists have faced this situation for decades. And they build up methodologies to assess projects with numerous indicators. In this work, 
we will use the traditional cost-benefit analysis method. Let's go to the methodology section to understand how to treat this topic. A mobility simulation is a simplified representation of the real world. If you give conditions, simulation models would help you to understand how people would react to a perturbation, which is exactly what we are looking for. Today, we will use MATIM, a famous multi-agent model. Multi-agents means that every person or vehicle is identified during the simulation. It is quite helpful to understand who can benefit the most from the service introduction. Here is the technical pipeline between the simulation and the appraisal framework. The MATIM model generates outputs, which we are able to translate into mobility indicators. All of these indicators will be monetized to provide a disaggregate analysis of social surplus due to the introduction of a new project. The cost-benefit analysis quantifies the incremental changes in welfare resulting from public intervention in transport markets. The goal is to assess the change in well-being of the individuals living in the society, and this involves calculating in monetary terms the magnitude of the potential gains compared with the opportunity cost of the resources divided from other users for the sake of the project. The CBA structure and methodology here is mostly based on French guidelines and reference values whenever it was possible. Some adaptation has been made in the consumer surplus for which the method differs and new references values were required. And the analysis is performed for a 10 years term. Let's go to the detail of the consumer surplus. It is based on the maximum score and a time equivalent method is used, which equalizes all agents' value of time. It, it also allows to perform equity analysis based on agent utilities variation. The operator profit is divided between three categories, the infrastructure, the rolling stock investment, and the operating cost. These categories are quite sensitive, and for now, not much information has been made public. For infrastructure on the rolling stock investment, sensibility analysis needs to be performed. For operational cost, it is easier to project ourselves as the demand as on-demand services already exist. Externalities impact are considered exactly following the French methodology, except that the parameter has been slightly changed to adapt to AV's ability. Last but not least, the sum of these surpluses are being considered to understand which situation is producing more social welfare. This indicator is a net present value, the sum of the consumer surplus, the operator profit, and the externalities impact. So we tried this CBA framework on the Berlin city. Here is the Berlin model developed by Dominique Ziemke. Available uh, transportation mode are cars, ride, PT, walk, and bicycle. PT is public transit. It is subdivided between rail, bus, tram, and ferry. The ride mode, which is being a car passenger, is available, but a fixed demand is attributed to this mode for easiness and concision. We will ignore them in the presentation. Note that the trip cannot uh, the um, traveler during a trip cannot use two different modes of transportation, such as AV uh, and public transit. It is, however, possible to use different public transit submodes. We design a dozen of scenarios, but for concision reason, we will only review five of them today. We have a return scenario which corresponds to the Berlin model without any on demand vehicles. We have a first couple of scenarios which will be the introduction of shared AV taxis completely free of charge operator either in door to door or in stop based routing. The second two scenarios are the car barn scenario, which are the exact same than the two previous ones. But we first an important cost to the people using their private car. We will call them the car bound scenarios. Our goal was to 
um, forbid people to enter the city with their car. So, the shared autonomous vehicle will be introduced in competition with other existing modes. All rate vehicles will be considered as AV for the evaluation step, as it would not be fair to compare thermic private vehicles to electrical AV. We made the assumption without modifying the simulation process. It is an important limit as the use of EV could modify travel behavior. Before to start on the result, I need to specify that we encounter trouble vanishing all calls for the two scenarios which require this. One person for the share still remain, and for the evaluation step, we consider them as every trips with an equivalent level of that. So for the distant travel, we can observe that for the two first scenario, AVs take passenger from all of the modes. But when we look into the travel time, the effect on congestion seems negative. As for car user travel less distance, here. But they spend more time traveling this distance. If we aggregate the total road vehicle kilometer travel, there, the AV introduction led to a slight increase. And if we focus on the two other scenario where we banish car from the city center, it has a surprising effect to push slow mode of, trans of transportation in the middle of the scene. I will need more time to understand how much it is due to us pushing the model too far, but it has one main consequence. The total travel time for all modes has increased significantly for more than 50% for the two last scenarios. So in the dozen of scenarios that we tried, although half of them were door to door, and the other half was stop based. Here, the result for the first scenario that we spoke about, but the result seems to be systematic. The stop based routing seems less attractive as the demand for this mode is systematically lower. The total demand for AV trips can be found almost proportionally in the AV kilometer travel. Uh, the number of trips per vehicle is slightly the same between the two routing, but the average vehicle kilometer travel is almost 30% less for the stop based routing. So the stop based routing is less attractive, but it also shows a higher resource efficiency. So the first thing which could be said is that the stop based routing has a higher occupancy rate than the door to door routing, but it has a cost. It, this cost is a higher, uh, lower uh, level of service. The stop base also has a higher average speed performances from plus 10% to plus 17%, which might be due to fewer stops itself due to its lower attractivity and the fact that the use of station could help to stay on the main roads. If we dive in the cost benefit analysis, Let's start with the first item, the consumer surplus. The consumer surplus represents the consumer welfare. For scale reason, I made a choice to dissociate the four experimental scenarios. The figure in the left represents the consumer surplus separation between the base case scenario and the scenarios in which the AV are still in competition with private car. Here, we can see that if we consider consumer surplus as a whole, the introduction of AV is a net loss. It is mainly due to the fact that if new users from world bicycle and public transit mode enjoy the new mode of transportation, the road network is more heavily mobilized. As the private car travelers share the roads with AVs, they will see their travel time increase due to congestion without enjoying the fun of AV. These travelers represent more than 30% of the model share, and we note that the stop based routing limits the decrease, but it is mainly due to its lower attractiveness. We can conclude that the decrease in consumer surplus is based on the increase of a few at the expense of the many. Before to go to the next slide, uh, next figure, the decrease of consumer surplus is comprised between minus 2000 and minus 2500 million euros. And the consumer surplus decrease for the two other scenarios where we banish car, car is much higher with a ratio to 1 to 250. It is due to the fact that we take one of the most efficient model alternatives out of the available alternative. 
The interesting point here is the difference in decrease from for the stop based routing, which is higher than the door to door routing, which is the opposite of the two previous scenarios. Maybe due to the fact that after getting the car out of the road, the stop based routing was least efficient and could not retain the demand as well as the door to door routing alternative. For the financial output, it is an evaluation which is quite clear. Both of the rolling stock uh, due to the fleet investment and the operating costs are lower for the car band scenario than heavy introduction scenario. The number of vehicles kilometer travel has an important impact on these variables. Surprisingly, the infrastructure cost does not represent such an important part of the total financial cost. We need to add that as most of cost value remain uncertain, a sensibility analysis, which we don't present here, needs to be performed. On the externality side, except for CO2 emission, whenever we add another mud on the road, it has side effects on the road surface use. For the carbon scenarios, the effect is clear. Whenever we take traffic out of the road, it has beneficial impact. Again, for scale reason, and it did to dissociate the result of the AV introduction on the car band. Even if the externality shows an improvement during the two car band scenarios, then the present value is negative for all four scenarios. It goes without saying that the net present value on investment cost is also negative. However, I just want to remind that the CBA is not supposed to take decision, but to be a tool to help people take decisions. We have all right to say that we don't want more pollution in our city and that we pr prefer the taxi without any private car. So here is a few limits before to leave you here. Uh, we had no intermodal trips. We, have, we did not consider the AV behavior for the people in the simulation steps and we have trouble in the simulation process. But our, our contribution is also that we uh, produced a CBA framework and we paired it with a simulation model. We also modestly contributed to the work comparing door to door routing and stop based routing. We can retain that stop based routing is more resource efficient but also less attractive. My next two use cases will be Sakle in the suburban area from Paris region and the last one, a rural case, still in the Paris region. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, Felix is actually here. So, in my understanding, he's uh, he's not here anymore. Wait, oh, you are here. Okay, oh, uh, I am. I am. Sorry, sorry, like I didn't see you in the list. Um, so, can you you can answer in person, or you would prefer to answer in chat? I will try in person. If it doesn't work, I will write it down. Okay. okay for you. The first question is regarding uh, whether you are testing autonomous vehicles for free or, you, or, or for the purpose of comparison. So yeah, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Lowe says that it doesn't know, that sounds like a very likely scenario. So how do you respond to that? Uh, I am sure that uh, I think that everybody can agree on that. It's not likely uh, at all. So we just push the model to see what could be the attractivity of AVs in this situation. But uh, as I said in the recording, we made something like a dozen of scenarios. And let's say that we have different level of attractivity for AVs, which are based uh, either on their ability to uh, share rides, uh, having free rides, having other capacities. But uh, yes, I think that we can all agree that having free taxis in the city is not likely. I think following up on that will be interesting to test that. I know Germany is experimenting with like uh, like cheaper like this is like nine euro traffic transit pass or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Seen, so it will be interesting to compare like once you have these AVs or you have these systems that are trying to promote in the in, in the aftermath of COVID, trying to promote transit. How would that uh, operate in, the, in in these scenarios? Yeah, I mean in this case we did not have intermodal trips in this simulation, but for the next use case. We will work on a um, module which could help us to get a fare which could be introduced in the um, daily fare for public transit. And that way you can have feeders 
to uh, the railway or rail services and thus having an integrated uh, AV services with the public transit transport and also public transit uh, fares. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions regarding this presentation? Okay, so- um, Thank you very much. No, 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 I have to question, right? <laughs> Two things, right? So I want to ask you about, like, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're focusing on the economic impact. Um, so uh, what, what did, first of all, like, how did the results compare to existing results that like, have used like these open scenarios? And then the second question would be like, what about policy implications, right? So based on your findings, how do you think these autonomous vehicles should be regulated in the case of Berlin? Um, I will answer to the second one, and I will ask you to repeat the first one because I didn't get it. Okay. Uh, but the second one, about the policy one, it's the fact that as the previous presentation showed that we couldn't control congestion in city centers, uh, which is something that we may already know with uh, the Uber and other NTC uh, company uh, introduction. And uh, for that, we have to focus maybe on more heavy, uh, heavy uh, services, which could be, uh, by example, uh, bus services, and um, where we could gain something would be the fact that we could operate public transit cheaper than we already are. So maybe the autonomous vehicles, uh, taxi services may not be the best solution or in some particular cases, such as uh, people with reduced mobility or elderly. Okay. So following up on uh, Mr. Law's follow-up, he says that your conclusion is that even for free, the consumer surplus for carry EVs will be negative, right? So this, yeah. so that's actually an interesting finding, on his opinion, and I think I think it's also very interesting. That's so, quite okay. surprising. I do agree. So regarding the first question, it's like I was wondering about how the results compare to the existing studies that have ad addressed the Berlin. I think a lot of people have worked on Berlin because of the open scenario. So, yeah. so how are your findings uh, match or this not match with existing studies? Um, I will be going somewhere else to compare my work. It's going to be the work of Clara Kuckelman uh, on the autonomous vehicle introduction. She has done with, with the team, I don't remember who, but uh, a work on the introduction of AV for, I think, the DOT. I'm not sure. Uh, that's maybe for what I saw, the most extensive work on the economic evaluation side for AVs and um, the main difference may be in the parameter where the value of time are considered lower for AVs than for the modes. And just even if we have maybe a higher consumption of mobility, it translates to a gain in time for people, like in the previous presentation. But from my side, I did not consider any uh, difference in value of time for private vehicles, commercial private vehicles and AVs. And the difference of consumer surplus may be found in the fact that people are traveling a little bit more, but at the same cost. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. So if you want to keep up the conversation, I think there's a lot of matching people here. So maybe you can pop <laughs> yourself. By yourself, sorry. So um, thank you very much. And I would like to move thank on. Thank you very much. So the next presenter will be uh, Mr. Yurton Fan. He's going to be talking about on-ramp merging strategies of connected autonomous vehicles considering communication delay. So can you please share your screen? Yeah. Could you hear me clearly? Yeah. Uh, now I'd like to share my, share, my, share my screen. So can you see my screen clearly? I can see the Excel uh, schedule. Okay, now I can see the presentation. Uh, yeah, share I begin. Uh, can you please use the percent? Yeah, there, there we go. Okay, we can uh, start. here we go. Okay, okay. So let so let so now let's begin. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So hello, good morning, everyone. This is Yukun Fang from the School of Information Engineering, Chang'an University in Xi'an, China. In this presentation, we show an um on ramp merging strategy of connected and automated vehicles, uh, considering the communication communication delay, where the statistical characteristics would be considered. 
uh, here is our e is our emails, and if there are any problems or questions, you could contact any of these email. And this slide outlines the main content of this presentation, and I'd like to share our work from these four uh, these four aspects, including the research background and significance, uh, methodologies experiments and simulations. And finally, I'd like to summarize our work. So the first part is about research background and significance. So we know um, RAM merging is a frequently encountered traffic scenario whose improper handling might cause heavy traffic congestion, even accidents. Since it could form a traffic bottleneck since the merging vehicles may have to slow down first and then or even stop at the ramp to wait for a proper opportunity to merge. To this end, collaborative control of connected and automated vehicles or CVs here enables the vehicle to cooperate with each other and emerge as an appealing strategy to conquer the affirmation challenges of on ramp merging. Here, I like to show any video. Mm, this video shows our uh, any of our real field tests of the cooperative control of the CVs, uh, which form a platoon and very and validate a car following model named IDM model, uh, intended driving model. So this model, in fact, is very simple, and we just want to test whether it's whether it works in the real field test. And in the future, maybe we would test more control law uh, on the test on the test platform. So, for this problem, for the on ramp mer for, for the on ramp merging problem, in the current studies. Most researchers may consider the on ramp merging problem from two aspects, I think. The first one is the allocation of the merging sequence. Uh, and the second one is about, is about, the, about the trajectory plan, uh, planning. Mm, merging sequence reflects the priority of a vehicle to pass the ramp, and its allocation will directly influence the trajectory planning while trajectory planning algorithm should firstly ensure the safety of all vehicles first and then control the vehicle's movement to pass the merging point with the expected merging sequences. However, solutions for both problems, the merging sequence allocation and the uh, trajectory generation, uh, tra tra for the trajectory planning, they both require the information exchange. That's to say, V2X communication is, is needed, while communication delay may cause negative impact on CV cooperative control, including increased risk of collision and violation of system stability. So motivation of this paper is to explore the statistical characteristics of V2I connection delay and its impact on the control effects for the on ramp merging problem. And next, we will go to the methodology part. And this slide would firstly briefly uh, de to describe the scenario, okay? In practice, we say that the main roads would usually consist of multiple lanes. However, in this paper, we focus on the merging scenario here and the impact of the communi communication delay to the on ramp merging. So we just take into consideration of the lane that is in conjunction with the ramp road to simplify the processing of modeling. And, and you can see in this figure, we uh, uh, the, re the, re the region described here uh, divided into delay estimation area control area and merging area the delay estimate the delay estimation area with the adjustable lens d is zone where the vehicle and the controller exchange their messages including the timestamp to estimate the communication delay and the control and the control area here is for the vehicle to adjust their 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 uh, their, their motions um, uh, to 
achieve a desired merging velocity Vm to prepare for the on-ramp merging. And the merging area here with known length m is the region where potential lateral collision of the vehicle exists. And in this paper, all vehicles pass the area with the same velocity Vm. However, I'd like to address that. What's wrong? Uh, no, you can continue. Uh, shall I continue? Yes, continue. Yes. Okay. So, so here, here we hope that the the vehicle could uh, uh, could uh, could uh, could achieve to Vm to pass the merging area, but it's just any it's just any ideal situation, and you can see later with the impact of the communication delay, uh, such 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 con certain such condition may not be achieved. Uh, oh, oh, oh. What's wrong? Uh, so, on run merging here is often considered from two aspects. They are mm, merging sequence generation and trajectory planning. Generation of the merging sequence is, is essentially, we think, is a, uh, a scheduling problem, which assigns the priority to pass the RAM to each vehicle. Mm, here, we formulate the merging sequence uh, assignment problem as a two-player complete information static game. Uh, but in this work, we want to, the highlight of this work is about the exploration of the communication delay. And this work is done in our previous work. And if you are interested about this game to, 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 to generate the merging sequence, maybe we could discuss later and we will focus on, and we will focus on the work of uh, this paper now. And the, ne the next problem is about the, is about the trajectory planning. For this problem, we adopted the, the we adopted the centralized control method proposed by these two authors, uh, and it's a centralized control method and constrains the merging area to contain only one vehicle to avoid lateral collision. So, uh, so that so that so that's to say we should uh, we could only consider the longitudinal control uh, is enough. Mm. And the authors formulated the trajectory planning problem as a bio objective optimization problem, considering the total fuel consumption and the total travel time. And, um, and the total uh, and trajectory of the vehicle can be finally determined by solving the metrics here. So I'd like to, I'd like to say, uh, this is proposed by these two authors and mm, it's just an ideal situation. And we will see, see, see later that uh, the communication delay would impact, would impact them. So, so far, maybe you, uh, mm, you are wondering, so what is your contribution? So our contribution is, uh, uh, is addressing the VDI communication delay estimation. Communication delay may cause negative impact on the CV co cooperative control. And the basic idea to mitigate such impact is to estimate the VGI communication delay and correct the state information in the trajectory planning metrics. The delay estimation area you just now see is designed for this purpose, where the CV and the RSU would exchange their messages, including timestamp to estimate the communication delay. And because, because the, uh, onboard you, the, onboard you, the onboard unit and the roadside, the roadside unit are different devices and it's, there, ex there exists the problem of asynchronization. So, so it's hard for us to just estimate the the delay for the single direction, but we could estimate uh, for any RTT the sum the the, the sum this means the sum the summation of the two communication two communication delay with the round trip time or with the estimation of, of the RTT vehicle state information can be corrected and trajectory planning metrics are also adjusted 
And since the time the RTD is short enough, we assume it's it, it is short it's, it uh, it is short enough in our paper. But uh, but later we can see that mm, such assumption is not that strong, and it's a limitation. And we will uh, do it in our future work. So here we just assume that it is short enough, and we crack we cracked the state uh, as as like that, and uh, our after the after the the correction, we got the p prime and the v prime, and we take them into the uh, trajectory planning matrix to modify the matrix and get the new uh, coefficients here and get and get the and get get the trajectory. And just now I said that we do the real field experiment to uh, to, uh, to 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 explore the statistical characteristics of the communication delay. So now let's see the experiments and uh, and the and the results. And the first, I like to introduce the test field and the platform uh, we. Uh, we in, we implemented the uh, we implemented the experiment. The, te the test field named the connected and automated vehicle test field of China University, and we use this platform to collect to collect to collect the V2X V2X uh, communication delay data. Although it installed many other sensors here, we just use the onboard unit here and the roadside unit here. Uh, they exchange the timestamps and to estimate the communication delay. So, the static the statistic characteristics of the V2I communication delay is firstly uh, is firstly explored in this work. Distributions of V2I connection delay could correlate with the application scenarios, and several probability density functions were explored in the literature by by other by other uh, by other authors, like the. Uh, like the normal distribution or Ryzen, Gamma, Weber, Nagami, and there exists other uh, kind of distribution. So we have designed uh, some scenarios to, uh, we have, some, we, we have uh, designed some scenarios to, uh, to validate them. The first scenario is the static open environment. And the set and the second one is the is the static environment with many shelters or like here means the trees or other uh, or the buildings around the vehicle, and the and the third scenario is about the driving but open environment. Uh, our con our con our conclusion is that all these mentioned distributions can be proper in a in some in some specific scenarios like this one, we see that. We see that gamma distribution could be more proper in this scenario with the many shelters. Uh, however, however, we we however we see that the probability density function can be approximated to normal distribution when the sample size is large enough and the density is concentrated at a central value. So with that, uh, with that uh, uh, communication de communication delay estimation area, if we set it as long enough, uh, the sample size could be uh, could be set, could be satisfied. And with with the with the distribution of the communication delay, we will we will set it in our simulation later. So in this case study, uh, the in this case study, communication delay will deteriorate the dynamic performance of the control process and potentially impact the final control effect. For this study, uh, the pre-designed acceleration still satisfies the constraints under the impact of the communication delay. Thus, the communication delay does not impact the final control result, but such delay might cause unexpected high ac ac acceleration or deacceleration in the control process. Although, although the safety constraint still, still, uh, is uh, still satisfied, um, this may lead to the uncomfortness of the passengers. Mm. However, 
in the next case study, we can see that uh, we can see that uh, the pre-designed acceleration exceeds the constraints on the impact of the communication delay. And in this case, if if the uh, pre-designed acceleration exceeds the range of that our platform, the vehicle would conduct the maximal acceleration or deacceleration, and this condition cannot be guaranteed. That means uh, in emerging area there could be two or more vehicles uh, at the same time, and the and the lateral control method should be considered. But uh, but it's a shame that we do not consider the lateral control. So. Uh, so the so uh, so the collision may be uh, the, so the collision may happen, and the and because of the trajectories of some vehicles are not pre-designed, the communication delay might cause potential lateral the might the, the lateral collision. Uh, it's time to summarize our work now, I think, and. In this work, we study the scenarios of on-ramp merging for CVs considering the communication delay of the VTR equipment. The authors divided the on-ramp merging area into three areas, uh, where delay, estimate, delay estimation area for the communication delay estimation and the control area for the trajectory adjusting for each vehicle to adjust their, their, uh, their, their maneuvers or states and the merging area is for passing the, uh, for each vehicle to pass the ramp and we formulated the merging sequence generation problem as a two-player complete information static game and the trajectory per, uh, planning problem as a buyer objective optimizing problem considering the total fuel consumption and the total travel time next uh, the statistical characteristics of the VTI communication delay were explored via real field tests in this work. We summarized that mm, distribution of the VTI communication delay could uh, strongly uh, correlate with the application scenarios. However, if the mm, uh, if the if the estimation uh, samples is large enough, uh, it can be a pro it can be approximated to normal distribution when the sample size is not enough and the density is concentrated at a central value. So, and with, the, and with, such, with such estimation, we could correct the state info and trajectory planning metrics. Mm, uh, correction of the state information and trajectory planning metrics can be done to mitigate the risk of collision in the merging area. Okay, there are still many problems and we would uh, and deficiencies in our current work and you are always welcome to ask any questions to share your ideas with us about the topic. Anyway, thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, you over here for three minutes, so I don't think we have a lot of time for questions, but um, are there questions regarding this presentation? Um, yeah, okay, he yes. Yes, here is our uh, here is our emails. If you uh, have any questions, maybe you are always welcome to contact us. Okay, so I have I... One, one simple question though. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit out of my field of expertise, so it might be a naive question, but uh, how is the performance of your model against the state of the art models that are addressing also this issue? Uh, pardon? P could you could you please could you please could you are please you speak slowly? Yeah, could you please? Uh, I wrote, yeah. in, wrote in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's the performance of your model against state of the art model addressing this phenomena? Mm, in fact, mm, in fact, we did not see. Uh, we did. In fact, we did not see the uh, field test of the state of the art models because, because the state of the art models, they are most of them are. Uh, are in the are in the are in the simu are in the simulation and all and and also we do not adjust the uh, the performance here. We want to explore the impact of the communication delay. In fact, hmm. but yeah, but I agree. I I would I would assume that if you want to evaluate this, like whether or not like con considering this uh, communication delay has an effect on the on the performance, that would be an interesting thing to evaluate as well. But I understand that there is now uh, field test results yet besides yours is that yeah. Right? yeah 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 yes yes okay yeah sorry. some yeah some of uh, some of the uh, 
Uh, no, 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 no. The, would you say V2V communication would improve the delay? Not that, no, 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 that. Uh, the, the, the communication delay, in fact, is, um, is, is dependent on the it's depend on the is depend on the scenario and the device device de, devices in fact the v2v communication may improve the may improve the the, the performance but um, v2v communi communication do, do, did not improve the do not improve the delay in fact okay did not improve it. yeah okay uh, i think that was a, that's an interesting finding that would one would think it is not counterintuitive right yeah uh, yes Okay, well, uh, time's up, so we'd like to wrap it up here. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, okay. So I'd like to sh uh, stop the sharing, okay? Yes. Okay. So okay. the next presentation is on fuel consumption elasticities, rebound effects and feed rate effectiveness in the Indian and Chinese new car market. Uh, Dr. Wansan? Yes. Uh, one moment. So let me start sharing my screen uh, one moment. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Great. You can go ahead, we can see it. Yes. Thank you for uh, joining the presentation. Uh, I will be talking about the demand side of automobile market in India and China. And this is a joint work with Rubal Dua, who is a research fellow at CAPSEC. So let's get started. So we know that the China and India are uh, kind of uh, top automobile market and their environmental performance index is also quite low. So both countries are thinking about ways to reduce the fuel consumption. The, there are two general ways which have been explored in the literature. One is more of a supply side policies where fuel economy standards are applied. And the idea of fuel economy standards is that manufacturers have a constraint that, okay, they can, they have to produce vehicles above certain economy, fuel economy. The feedback policy is the another uh, policy lever which has not been explored so much in detail or at least in practice. But the main idea is uh, encouraging consumers to buy more fuel efficient vehicle. And uh, the, the main, they, what they do is they create a pivot point on the fuel economy. And above that fuel economy, if you buy a vehicle above that fuel economy, you get the rebate on that. And if you buy a vehicle below that fuel economy, you have to pay additional fee. So the idea is if you want to really understand any of these uh, fuel economy, especially the demand side policies, we need to understand uh, the sensitivity of car buyers' preferences to buy fuel efficient cars. But buying fuel efficient cars is not enough because there are, there are enough evidence in the literature that sometimes when we have fuel efficient car, our cost will decrease. And uh, when the operating cost decreases, we might drive further. So that's a possibility, or there might be indirect rebound effect where the savings from petrol bills can be used in holiday in Spain or, or somewhere. So finding the indirect effect is very difficult, but at least we can identify the direct effect on the, on the vehicle kilometers. So the, the main idea of uh, this uh, talk is how do we estimate the choices as well as the uses jointly and what is the what are the challenges that that are important? And after estimating these models, how do we compute the fuel consumption elasticities or figure out the effectiveness of the feedback policies? So brief background on the literature. So there has been, I mean, history of work on understanding these uh, effect of the policies on the demand side, energy consumptions. Uh, it, it dates back to Dubin and McFed in 1984, but what they do is they estimate uh, choices as well as the uses separately but if you think about it operating cost also affect the choices as well as the uh, uses so there should be some cross restrictions across equations if you think from a structural modeling perspective so this has been a long-standing issue which was uh, addressed by vento in 2009 so they developed a utility theoretical framework where they modeled both dimensions simultaneously and the idea of their framework is uh, 
they have the indirect utility in the, they have the operating cost in the indirect utility of a car choice model and they apply the royal identity on that model to derive the travel demand from it which is basically the vehicle kilometers traveled we will see how exactly works when i get to the model that how the ventos model works but the application of the ventos model in uh, in automobile market is scarce and uh, most people either in uh, most studies in developing countries or even developed countries ignore the rebound effect in developing countries most studies use generally aggregate time series data to estimate these elasticities with an exception to when proper who, who has actually adopted the bentos uh, approach but in a very old data in india and uh, yeah so the the main over, main contribution of this study is to really develop a theoretical consistent joint discrete continuous mixed logic model for car buyers preferences for types and uses while accounting for rebound effect and get the results for top two markets like india and china to see how these demand side policies affect the uh, fuel consumption we write the full information likelihood and an analytical gradient the bentos method is more the bayesian estimation but uh, doing it through uh, likelihood is much more complex but uh, uh, bayesian estimation have itself so many assumptions so we we decided to stick with the likelihood based estimation we use the national level data on chinese and uh, indian car buyers which have uh, socio demographics reveal preferences car and car types in the car use so main outcome of this study is we provide the fuel price and income elasticity of fuel consumption uh, we also get estimates of the effect of purchase price reduction and fuel economy improvements on the fuel consumption and finally we conclude with the effect of revenue neutral fee wet policy on the fleet fuel economy and fuel consumption so we'll see how we get the model and estimate it and get to these main outcomes so briefly about the choice model that we are going to estimate so so first look at the choice uh, utility equation so we have three components in it if we look at it uh we have yi minus rj which is income minus the annualized rental cost of the car xij include all other factors which can be you know horsepower of the of the vehicle or maybe maybe individual level characteristics can also be included here pj is the operating cost and basically we will see how beta i and alpha i have their their own meaning in themselves we have alpha and beta i to be some form of the log normal log normal distribution to ensure that the marginal utility of income remains positive and the marginal utility of the operating cost becomes negative and once you have the vij ready you can obviously use the traditional uh, choice formula to compute the probabilities one thing to note here is who who are into choice modeling because the utility is non linear we can actually identify the scale in this model so you can see uij divided by mu in the probability equation so as as i have been talking about we can apply the royce identity because operating cost is there on the pj so now we apply the royce identity on the vij and once we apply the royce identity on vij we get the kilometer ij as a function as in this functional form so if we look at this carefully it becomes a linear regression where uh, where the dependent variable is log normal uh, ln kilometer ij right so we have uh, now we didn't ask i mean we have defined the utility equation in a way that we get the kilometer ij in a in a specific form that we wanted so this is how we connect these two choice and the uses equation together once we have the choice and uses equations together we know i mean this this likelihood for the kilometer for the annual driving distance is not difficult because it's just a linear regression so what we do is we write a joint likelihood that you see on the right i wouldn't get into the details but uh, one important thing to note here is we use the weights based on the sales of the vehicles so we use the choice based sampling weights in here and um, just to ensure that our sample is representative and the results are transferable so we wrote the code matlab code with analytical gradient to maximize this wll and we use the sandwich estimator to compute the standard errors okay so 
data set, we have the initial quality survey data collection in India and China. And uh, the constraint that we have on the new car buyers is at least they have ownership of two to six months. We have several alternative specific attributes as well as we use the aggregate sales data to compute the weights. And we also have several demographic characteristics of the consumers. The point that is that is difficult that makes this uh, whole estimation difficult. India and China have 81 and 234 car models in the market. So if we assume that everyone has all these models in their choice set, they have 81 and 234 choice alternatives in their choice set, which makes it difficult to estimate the model. And also the number of households are around 8,000 and 9,000 9, in, in India and China samples. We also present the choice-based sampling weights that we get, which means, uh, I mean, these are reasonable ranges, which means that we have enough representation of these models in, the, in our data. So this is a good news uh, in some sense. Some very interesting contrasting uh, results about uh, China and India vehicle buyers. So fleet fuel economy of India is much higher and which is expected because India has more compact and uh, mid-size segment as compared to more SUVs in China. Uh, as expected, uh, we have a lot of correlation across the attributes and that makes the reveal preference uh, estimation of a choice model using reveal preference very difficult. So what we do is when we have the fuel economy and purchase price, we only have one or one more attribute in the utility equation to avoid these correlation issues. Moreover, our utility is more nonlinear, so these correlations are dim diminishes a bit. Another interesting finding from the descriptive analysis is 42% of the car buyers are female in China, but these are just 5% in India. So this, this is a very interesting, at least when I was doing this, I, I really found that, I mean, this is very contrasted. So household size, as expected, is much higher in India compared to China. Annual income is much higher in China compared to India, but annual VKT is similar in both markets. In terms of model specifications, uh, as I said, uh, we need to make assumptions on the car life and the uh, interest rate so that we can analyze their cost so that we can, we can subtract it from income. Uh, we assume that the fuel prices remains uh, the same across the models and the variation in operating cost is coming from the fuel economy. We also include the make and segment specific fixed effects to account for the unobserved vehicle characteristics. I mean, we don't include the model specific fixed effects because the number of parameters increases sub substantially. Even after writing the analytical gradient, we have uh, 234 alternatives and 100 parameters. So estimation time is around 50 hours for China. So it's not possible to include or make more model more complex. Also, we make an assumption that all households have the same choice set because we don't have any other way to create the individual specific choice sets. So let's get to the initial assessment of the model fit. Uh, what I present here is for China, the segment level market share and the vehicle kilometers travel. And what you see is the actual and the predicted one. And we can see that the actual and the predicted one have uh, actual and the predicted one have very similar say, that means that the model is working well. So this is just an initial assessment of the model. Now let's get back to the main results. So this table summarizes the model estimation results. To make it simple, uh, I segment the table into three parts. In the first part, which is the fixed parameter part, it is kind of corresponding to xij we have demographics related variables. So we see that the males with higher car ownership and the larger families drive more in both countries and car buyers from both countries with larger families prefer larger vehicles. Uh, this can be seen from the coefficient of the family size, right? And uh, as well as uh, you can see the relationship between family size and the length, width and the height. Moreover, uh, there are random parameters out there. Uh, the both standard deviations are significant, but we can't interpret them uh, directly. So better to look for the short run elasticity of the vehicle kilometers traveled. 
So one point that I forgot to mention that uh, the alpha i and the the alpha i and the beta i can be if you take the log kilometer ij on the left hand side, then the beta ij and the alpha i can be converted into the elasticity of the kilometer ij. So that's how we use the not the elasticity, we need to multiply with the average income as well as the average operating cost to the alpha i and the beta i, and then we can get the average elasticity estimates. So this is how we compute uh, the short run elasticity for elasticity of vehicle kilometer travel that you see here. So these estimates are 0.14 and minus 0.18 for India and 0.12 and minus 0.28 for China. So we can see that the it's fairly inelastic with respect to income and the fuel price. And uh, this is also related with existing results. The short run income elasticity for VKT is just 0 0.28 for India, and it's not significant for China in the existing literature. And our results are slightly lower, but in the similar ballpark area. Now we also look at the segment level purchase price elasticity. So the main idea is we increase the purchase price of uh, vehicles in that segment by 5% and allow consumers to choose new cars and then new VKT. So we have uh, three main columns in this table. Market share elasticity, it is just the direct effect on the shares of the segments. The second is the fuel consumption elasticity. Here we assume the switching to the new cars as well as changes in the vehicle kilometers traveled. But there is another elasticity that we compute, which is fuel consumption elasticity, no rebound. So in this case, we compute the changes in the fuel consumption, but we don't, we, we allow for changes in the, uh, we allow for the changes in the, uh vehicle choice but not on the fuel consumption and we see how that affects the total fuel consumption so if we look at uh, fuel consumption elasticity and fuel consumption elasticity without rebound they are very similar that means that the rebound effect is not so high for the purchase price and the fuel consumption elasticity ranges are minus 3.47 to 0 0.16 uh, depending on the segment that we are looking for and uh, Similarly, we do it for the fuel economy. And here, the, the column meaning remains the same. But if you look at the fuel consumption elasticity and fuel consumption elasticity without rebound, we see substantial differences. So we, we see that the, for China, the rebound effect is around 18.8%, which is pretty high. We don't present the India results here, but uh, for India, we get around 17.1%. Okay, so now let's get to the pivot policy results. So as I said in the beginning of the presentation, the, the idea of the pivot policy is we, the consumers who buy vehicles with higher fuel economy above the anchor point or the pivot point, they get some rebate, but if they buy a vehicle with lower fuel economy than the anchor point, then they have to pay additional fee. So we design, we make some adjustments in the model and try to figure out that what should be the uh, what should be the anchor point and how should be the slope of this line such that the pivot policy remains the neutral. But what we found that if we, even we apply this pivot policy in our in our India and China, the fuel economy improvement, the fuel economy increase of the fleet is not so substantial. Fuel saving is also not so substantial. It is less than 1%. An interesting thing is we don't see a lot of rebound effect of pivot policy, and which is expected because purchase price doesn't have the rebound effect so much. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we have uh, developed a theoretically consistent utility framework and provided new elasticity and rebound effect estimates for the India and China automobile market. In conclusion, we can see that the demand side policies are not very effective in reducing fuel consumption. So perhaps the supply side policies, for example, fuel economy standards might be a way forward. 
in terms of some limitations of the study, we don't consider the used car market, but considering the used car market can uh, change these elasticity substantially. But I am not aware of many, even any study which has considered the used car market because it is difficult to get the data. And we don't have the outside good option. Uh, in the sense, we assume that even if you increase the purchase price, the consumers will remain there in the market. They won't go or shift to the public transportation. But yeah, this, this issue can be addressed in future studies. Thank you. I, um, sorry, sorry about that, from language. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions regarding uh, the presentation we just saw? Okay, so I have one simple question uh, regarding the elasticity that you report in, uh, and you show that the range that is supporting the literature. Uh, which slide was that? Uh, I think. Uh, slide yes. Slide top, yes. So, so your 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 elasticity estimates are actually lower than the lower bound, or, or higher than the, the are the smaller, right? In, in terms of magnitude. Yes. So, so yes. how do you explain? What do you think account for that difference? Well, I think uh, first thing is we are estimating them jointly, the choices and the vehicle kilometer travel. So that might be one modeling issue that, that might be creating that difference. And the other thing is the data that we are using is relatively new, but the, these estimates are from 2004 and 2005. So, or sometimes, you know, very old data sets. So that might be another difference that may be the Consumers' preferences have evolved over the time, and that might cause the changes in the elasticity. And uh, also, I'm curious, how many studies are on? How, you, you show the range, right? So, how many studies are there summarizing in these uh, reports? Not many, actually. Uh, less than ten, I think, okay? because getting this data is very difficult. And modeling is, you can say, the estimation takes fifty hours, even yeah. after the likelihood is, uh, even after the analytical gradient. So. Yeah, not many uh, people have tried this. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are, I have one very short question regarding the choice set size. So you so you said that you have uh, eighty four for India and uh, one hundred yeah. and sorry eighty one and two hundred thirty four. So are you sampling here or no? You're using on the whole. Uh, yeah, we are we are considering the whole choice set because uh, if we start sampling based on the choice of the person, then yeah. we get into the endogeneity issues. Yeah. So that's a challenging aspect. Uh, even most studies have to focus or rely on this aspect. So that's why generally you will see that the studies in this segment are more market level studies rather than the individual level studies. So they okay. use the BLP type models uh, to estimate uh, elasticities rather than the individual level disaggregate models. Okay. Yeah, so that's a, that's a challenge here. Uh, we can't help much until and unless we ask respondents that, oh, which are the vehicles that you considered before buying this vehicle? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If, if we ask this question, then this issue can be sorted. But I think from the modeling perspective, I don't see easy solution to this question. No, I mean, like, I was just surprised that I actually got the model running, right? So we got such a large... <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and we got the market share matching and the VKT matching. So we were quite confident that it is working. Okay. No, that's uh, very interesting. I'm always, I'm always uh, uh, curious about this large choice and how to deal with that. Um, yeah. Okay, so we had a little bit of our time, so I would like to wrap it up here if there are no any other questions. So Great, thanks. thank you very much. Okay, and uh, last but not least, uh, we have, sorry, let me go back to my slides here. Uh, so. Uh, Dr. Hua is going to be talking about optimization of vehicle assignment for sharing vehicles. I know we are over time, but don't worry because we started late, so we have permission to uh, extend as much as necessary. So, uh, Dr. Hua, please take your time. So, 15 minutes for presentation and five for discussion. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I'm the last one. <laughs> yes. Okay. Five hours later, uh, we started the final, uh, final presentation. I'm Kai Huang, a senior professor at the Southeast University in China. And uh, the work is cooperative with uh, Dr. Yan Tong Huang and uh, Professor Carl Hockman at the University of Texas at Houston. So the, the title is the Optimization and the, of Vehicle Assignments 
for sharing vehicles. Okay, I have a look at the uh, pictures. As we know, the total demand of the uh, of the vehicles is always changed from day to day, especially when we see uh, when we meet the bad weather and the special day. So, if we want to decide the vehicle summit at the beginning of the day, how to do it, uh, consider considering the time frame, total demand. So we uh, in this paper, we are going to make the strategic planning of the SAV in Austin. Uh, it includes the free size and the brick assignment in park spaces. And we will use the optimizing and the simulation uh, models together to decide the brick assignment and uh, improve the service threat. Uh, at the beginning, when we consider to decide the free size, we still have some challenges. The first one is the uh, uncertain demand. Actually, the demand changes from minute to minute, hour to hour, and day to day. So the next one is that if we use a simulation model to decide the vehicle assignment, we have some challenges because of the key inputs like the full size static question, static question are given before we conduct in the simulation model. So in this way, we can't get the optimal result. But if we use another method, optimizing model, but it's not perfect, it can't decide the short-term and real-time operations. And actually, the optimizing for the stranded planning normally used for the long-term decision. So in this way, we propose the combined method, stochastic optimization and the simulation model together. We are going to maximize the profit of the system welfare based on the giving complex demand scenarios or changeable uh, over time and space. So in the two-step solution method, the first one is to decide the strategic planning. And uh, the question is, what's the strategic planning? Normally, uh, we should decide the strategic question uh, in the long term. Maybe it's fixed for a month or even a year. And then we should decide the vehicle allocation, like for the same operator that should decide how many vehicles to allocate in each station. It's also a long term decision. And then in the sixth state, what's, we should answer what's the operational decisions? It's to check the vehicle real time movement and check the exact battery capacity change of the electrical vehicles that we use it. And then What's the demand of setting? It's because the departures of the uh, people at my room follow a no distribution model from day to day. So in this, here, so the operation decisions from day to day on certain demand. We have the no demand, demand distribution, but the network uh, is changed. The SOC of vehicles is changed. Uh, also, we have the real-time vehicle allocation, relocation to fill the demand and supply imbalance. Okay, in this way, we propose the optimization and the simulation together for the best services. Uh, we use the optimization model to get the right of the strategic planning and then as to uh, take its right as an input in a second stage of the operation decisions. And then we run a simulation in the operation decisions to get a right, come back to uh, uh, make change of the state planning. From such a circle, we can finally get the best resources. Okay, the first part is the free size with uh, Without range constraints, it means we use a normal vehicle 
Black is the case limit rules. We are going to make the operating profit. It's to maximize the, uh, uh, it's, it's the max, max the revenues minus the vehicle ownership or power consumption and the vehicle relocation costs. Here, so the math model. In the constraints, we consider the free size constraints around the certified demand, free size of living, idling, uh, of vehicles, and a lot of vehicles in the next time step. So, uh, we have uh, the first uh, one is uh, to use uh, uh, grouping and uh, Python to solve such a uh, complex uh, optimization model. Groovy is a commercial solver to solve the uh, programming model. And then in the same stage, we use the uh, Sumo to conduct the engine based simulation to get the operational decisions. And then we use the uh, case of Austin with six countries and uh, over 2,000 traffic nodes and uh, 23,000 links. We use the chemicals to generate 100 traffic rooms for the operation model and use around the three hours simulation. Here's the result. We can find if we have the higher fares, but can, can, can just get the low profit because the higher fares lead to the reduce of the total demand. And uh, the higher return cost will also uh, reduce reduce the return rates to save the uh, operation cost. And also, the high owner operation cost will quickly drop our profits and free size. Actually, another sensitivity analysis shows that the highest profit can be obtained. When we set the vehicle price at $1.6 dollars per mile and keep the vehicle cost as 30 cents per mile. If we are increasing the vehicle cost from 10 cents to 30 cents per mile, the profit drop quickly from uh, 19 to 15 dollars per SV. If we run through our, which can be seen as uh, 25 or total trips, it uh, can estimate, estimate that the daily profit uh, can reach uh, 14 and uh, two, 18 dollars uh, for SAV, and SAV can obtain such uh, profit. Okay, here's so the solution result. Uh, the final result so the, the purpose the two best stochastic optimization model can ensure the steady surface rate and uh, handle the random departure scenarios uh, by using the flexible vehicle steering operation. Okay, the second part is the fleet has basic range It means we use the electrical vehicles. Here, so the example, if the vehicle's location is not changed, but the time change means the vehicle is recharging, so we have the recharge function. And if his location and the time is changed, it means the vehicle is used. His battery will be lower. We have such a discharge function. Okay, last one, so this uh, 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 recharge rate. Okay, here's the a case. Now we have two vehicles, vehicle one and vehicle two has a different battery. And we have three children to serve. So one, two, three. And the uh, depart time is different. The first one is from the first time step. And the second one, third one from the time step two. And they also have really need a different battery. battery. So if we have the case one, we use the vehicle with the largest battery to serve the red. And then it's the battery will drop. And uh, at the time two, we use the uh, two vehicles to try to serve the tube two and tube three. And the last so that the tube three, the largest vehicle, large, largest vehicle 
only have 60% of the battery can't serve the two string, and only the two two can serve. Here's through the case one, but in the case two, if we try to use the lower slow vehicle to serve the trip, um, and uh, at the time step two, we still have two vehicles to cover the two two and two three, means the two two and two three can be real serve. It means uh, the use function of the the function of use uh, optimization to get the best results. Okay, here's the model. It's also to maximize the total profit. Here's the mathematical model. And uh, we use the same method of the operating uh, of group is solving. Here's the result. We can get the same solutions if we ask the electrics have the large better question. Maybe fully better question can over 200 kilometers. That means the electrode becomes a gasoline vehicle. And if we reduce the better question, the free size drop, uh, the, the, the profit of SV will drop and the free size increase. Here's the change of the SOC, the state of uh, charge of vehicles. The average SOC, better question, of vehicles is the lowest at the middle of peak hours. And then start to increase uh, with the charge for some time. And uh, the server rate is also low. We have the peak uh, demand because the, we have no enough vehicles, enough vehicles of server rate. Okay, it's all, thanks. Ah, oh, okay. Are you are you okay? So, yeah. Okay. So, um, are there any questions regarding this presentation? You can write it on the chat if you have any. Okay. So, um, I have one question regarding that. Your your objective function, basically, your, your objective variable is the profit maximization, right? Okay. Let's move to the mathematical model. Maybe the first press. First one is uh, clear. So, here. so your yeah. objective here is to maximize profits, right? Yes. Uh, but yeah. in, some, in some cases, like um, the socially desirable situation is not necessarily the situation where profits are, are maximized. So we consider like other objectives, objective variables other than profit maximization. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, for the mathematical model, uh, we have uh, different uh, people will focus on different uh, uh, focus on different operating function. In this one, we are going to make some profit. Actually, if we use the view of the op uh, the government, maybe we can change the operating function to make the service right, right, because the government focuses on the service right. Actually. Uh, but uh, for the decimal robots, we have the same decimal robots. And uh, the uh, constraints, maybe most of the constraints are sound. So we can just change the uh, uh, objective function to have the different routes. Okay, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions regarding this presentation? Anybody doing um, autonomous vehicles? Okay, yes, there, uh, my presentation is focused on the set of vehicles. So it's a little long from the autonomous vehicles, I think. Maybe the, uh, yes. Maybe no, the, I, I think there are some other people that are working in similar ages that might be interested as well. So I wanna ask you about um, uh, performance then, like uh, in terms of like estimation time and calculation times, like how, how much are we talking about here? Uh, for the uh, here is based on the uh, the scale of the network. Actually, I use the network of the Austin. It's yeah. uh, it's 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 okay. Uh, we have hum we have when we like this one. When we try to reduce the competition uh, burden, I use the chemist to generate so uh, one hundred twenty nodes. It's okay. Just three hours, maybe five hours. The five minutes of uh, per time step, 
So it's a kind of the, I think, uh, okay, uh, I know it's uh, within 10 minutes. I can solve it. Use uh, Groovy. So say that again? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Are there okay. any other questions? Um, doesn't seem that there are any other questions. So I see already over time, I would like to wrap it up here. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm really sorry about the, all the th all the things that happened at the beginning. <laughs> we got it running, and I think that's the uh, the important thing. So thank you so much for joining. I know some of you are like like it was like five or six a.m. in the morning. So um, you can go to bed now. And I would like to uh, pass it on to the next uh, host. Uh, there you go. Give me a second. Uh, wait. There you go. Uh, Okay, sorry for the delay and uh, thank you again for joining. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me first share my screen. Uh, well, due to the uh, some some technical problems where uh, we started 20 minutes late. So, uh, well, welcome to the first uh, fourth bridging transportation researchers conference. And uh, thank you for participating in the shared mobility session. Uh, I'm today's moderator, Xiao Ranqing from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, well, the, um, the rapid expansion of shared mobility services has had sustainable um, impacts on the way people travel and on, also on the multimodal uh, urban transportation systems. So as a demand for convenience and comfortable mobility grows, on mode ride sourcing services are becoming the preferred travel solutions for more people. This brings not only uh, opportunities, but also challenges to the entire transport system. Um, the massive demand for ride sourcing puts enormous press on ride sourcing platform as more efficient and effective responses are required. So um, this session will bring together presentations on both theoretical models and uh, innovative AI algorithm to discuss some uh, emerging research topics in shared mobility market. So um, the first two uh, session will bring, uh, the first two uh, presentation will uh, report on the future development of uh, the entire shared mobility industry. The first for uh, platform competition and the second for the coordination with uh, public transit. Then the remaining two presentations will focus on the uh, operation of uh, right sourcing platforms. The first for matching function validation and the second for queuing management with incentive schemes. Uh, so uh, each speaker will have 20 minutes for presentation and uh, five minutes for Q&A. So uh, for the audience, please post any questions for our presentations in the chat box. And uh, I will uh, give these questions to the speaker. So uh, now let me uh, introduce our uh, four speakers in this session. The first one is Ms. Ya Tian Zhou. Uh, she received a bachelor's degree in traffic engineering from the Southeast University and is now a PhD candidate in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, her research interests include platform integration and competition, matching frictions and market fragment, fragmentation, uh, multi-homing in rice sourcing markets and service bundling. And uh, our uh, second speaker, Mr. Si Yuanfeng, uh, he received a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Tongji University and a master's degree in civil engineering from University of California, Berkeley, and is now a PhD candidate in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. His research interests include uh, economical modeling of multimodal mobility, 
okay? Deep learning in spatial temporal traffic uh, forecasting, reinforcement learning in multimodal transportation and uh, urban computing. Uh, our third speaker, Shu Qing Wei. Uh, she is a PhD candidate at uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. She received her uh, bachelor's degree in traffic engineering from Southeast University and a master's uh, degree in big data technology from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Her main research interests lie in uh, intelligent transportation, big data, and uh, machine learning methods. Uh, so uh, our first um, speaker, Yu Han Liu, she's a PhD candidate at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. She got her bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from the Nankai University and a master's degree in statistic operation research from the uh, University of Edinburgh. Her research interest mainly lies in the passengers waiting behavior in rice sourcing markets. So uh, that's all for my introduction and uh, let's welcome the first uh, speaker, Ms. Ya Chenzhou. Uh, you can start if you're ready. Um, hello, everyone. Um, today's topic is price of competition and fragmentation in rice sourcing markets. I'm the presenter, Ya Qian Zhou. Um, the presentation includes three parts. In the first part, I will give a brief introduction to the potential impacts of competitions and then the research motivations. In the second part, I will discuss the model and the methodology to characterize a rice sourcing market with an arbitrary number of competing platforms. Next, I will introduce, uh, illustrate the main theoretical and numerical findings. And let's begin with the research introduction. Um, competition is common in the right sourcing market. For example, um, DD and Meituan uh, are competing with each other in China. On the one hand, and like other service markets, competition in the right sourcing markets prevents a monopolist platform from greatly maximizing its own profit by distorting its operating strategies from socially efficient levels. On the other hand, competition between platforms leads to market fragmentation, thereby increasing matching frictions and the passengers' waiting time. Let us imagine a scenario where the matching function exhibits increasing returns to scale, and thus the matching is more efficient as more passengers and drivers are involved in one platform. In this case, it is intuitively expected that the more the number of platforms, the more fragmented the market. Thus, the higher the matching frictions, resulting in higher passengers' waiting time and a lower social welfare. Meanwhile, the competitive platforms may adjust trip fares and wages to combat the increased matching frictions caused by market fragmentation, and these decision adjustments may further affect market outcomes. And while most previous studies for rice sourcing services examine a monopoly market, and a few researches are directed toward a duopoly rice sourcing market, it is therefore intriguing to investigate the trends of the platform profit, social welfare, inefficiency degree, as well as other market measures with respect to the increase of number of the platforms from monopoly to oligopoly to perfect competition market and the presence of a matching fragmentation effect when the matching function exhibits increasing constant and a decreasing returns to scale respectively. The next, we talk about the model and the methodology. Um, consider a rice sourcing market with the competing platforms and the stationary equilibrium at which, 
at which a driver only works for one particular platform and a passenger only sends rights request to one platform for a particular trip. Um, for each trip, passengers of platform I pay an average average trip bell FI, experience an average average waiting time, WIC, and an average in-vehicle travel time, T. We assume passengers are homogeneous in value of time, beta. An equilibrium for passengers is reached when the generalized report costs of all active platforms are equal. And where BQ on the function BQ denotes the inverse demand function, which represents the generalized travel cost as a function of the total real, uh, realized amount. And the Cobb-Dugler type matching function is used to approximate the matching friction between drivers and the passengers. And we assume that this Cobb-Dugler type matching function applies for each right sourcing platform with the same parameters. And specifically the matching rate MICV, namely um, the number of matched driver passenger pairs per unit time depends on the numbers of idle vehicles, NIV and waiting passengers, um, NIC. Um, where A is the scaling parameter that captures some external factors such as the market area and the cruising speed. Um, alpha 1 and alpha 2 denote the elasticities of the matching function. Um, based on the little law, the number of waiting passengers and I see is equal to the product of the uh, arrival rate of passengers QI and the waiting time WIC. Similarly, the number of idle vehicles NIV is equal to the product of the uh, arrival rate of idle vehicles SIV and the uh, average idle time WIV. To summarize, the matching rate MICV can be formally written as below. Um, considering the market clearing condition MICV equal to SI, uh, SIV equal to QI. In other words, the matching rate equals both the arrival rate of idle vehicles and the arrival rate of waiting passengers. At the stationary state, the number of active vehicles equals the sum of idle vehicles and the occupied vehicles. Um, NI equal to um, QI times WIV plus QI times T. Um, in face of alternative job options, a potential driver will decide to offer right service for platform only if his or her average earning rate RI is greater than or equal to his or her um, reservation earning rate R. Note that RI can be given by the ratio of total revenue of all drivers, the product of the average wage per order EI and the uh, matching rate MICV to the vehicle fleet size NI. Um, An equilibrium for drivers is reached when the earning rates of all active platforms are equal where the function G is the cumulative distribution function of a driver's reservation and your rate R. Um, consider a Nash game where um, each platform aims to maximize its profit by determining the average, average trip fare FI and the average trip wage EI. The platform I's objective is to maximize its profit given the price and the wage strategies of other platforms. Um, where C, I, Q, I, and I is the additional operation cost of platform I apart from its wage payment to affiliated drivers. Um, we also consider the socially optimal scenario where a social planner or platforms maximize total welfare, which can be obtained by solving the following welfare maximizing problem. 
Um, to quantify the inefficiency ratio of an arbitrary market, monopoly or oligopoly or perfect competition, we propose an inefficiency ratio, the ratio of social welfare under a social optimum to social welfare under a competitive Nash equilibrium. Uh, clearly, rho is um, greater than or equal to one, which quantifies how the efficiency of the resource market degrades due to selfish behavior of the competing platforms. Specifically, rho equal to one is the ideal state of a competitive market where there is no efficiency loss. And lastly, we discuss some important theoretical and numerical findings. Um, first, we find that when the market becomes perfect competition, the market is fully efficient. From this figure, we can see that the, the inefficiency ratio de decreases with um, decreases with the number of platforms and approaches to one as number of platforms increases to infinity. Um, moreover, we find that as the number of platforms increases to infinity, total realized demand, total vehicle fleet size, and social welfare in the market with decreasing returns to scale are the greatest and followed by the case with the constant and the then increasing return to scale. Um, from this figure, we can see that as, as the number of platforms increase to infinity, we can see this here. Um, total realized demand in the case with the decreasing returns to scale of the matching function is the greatest, the red line here at this point. Um, from this figure, we can see that uh, um, as the number of platforms increases to infinity, total vehicle fleet size in the case with decreasing returns to scale is the greatest, this point. Um, from this figure, we can see that as a number of platforms increases to infinity, social welfare in the case with a decreasing return to scale is the greatest, followed by um, constant return to scale and then increasing return to scale, this point. Um, the numerical um, as examples confirm our, our theoretical findings. The reason is that as the number of platforms increases to infinity, the waiting time in the case with decreasing return to scale of the matching function is the lowest. Um, we also uh, theoretically find that total profit approaches zeros in the case zero in the cases of with the constant and decreasing return to scale, but approaches a negative value in the case with the increasing return to scale. Um, from this figure, we can see that as the number of platforms increases to um, infinity, total profit approaches to zero in the case with a constant and decreasing return to scale, but approaches a negative value in the case with increasing return to scale this point. And furthermore, we find that the social planner behaves quite differently in the case with different elasticities of matching functions. Um, if on the matching function exhibits constant return to scale, passenger waiting time is independent of the number of platforms, and thus decision variables and the various market measures at social optimum, such as trip fare, wage, total fleet size, total demand, total profit, and social welfare do not change with the number of platforms. Um, from the numerical examples, we can see, um, see the blue lines. We also find that compared with the social planner, the for-profit platforms will decrease trip fare to attract more passengers and recruit more drivers to maximize its profit. As a result, social welfare increases with the number of platforms, but total profit decreases with the number of platforms. Um, 
And if the matching function exhibits increasing return to scale, the more, more fragmented the market, the higher the waiting time of passengers, indicating that, um, that the market fragmentation externality is negative. In this case, to internalize, internalize um, the market fragmentation externality with the more powerful forms, the social planner tends to increase trip fare and a way to suppress total realized demand and a total vehicle fleet size, leading to a decrease in social welfare. Um, from the numerical examples, see the origin lines. We also find that due to the, the intensified competition, the for profit platforms behave in the opposite way. That is the for profit the platforms will reduce trip fare, reduce trip fare, and they increase wage to stimulate a higher total realized demand and the total vehicle fleet size to secure their profits. As a result, social welfare initially increase and then decrease with the number of platforms. Nevertheless, the total profit obtained and actually overall the social optimum decrease with the number of platforms. See the origin lines. We further find that when the number of platforms is relatively small, platforms can be more profitable in the market with um, in the market where the matching function exhibits increasing returns to scale. The distinct trends of these key market measures we discussed are attributed to the joint effects of um, platform markup the market fragmentation externality and the matching externality. Um, that's all, thank you for listening. Oh, well, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. So uh, is there any questions from the audience? Okay, I may uh, start asking you a simple question. Uh, so um, this topic is worth of exploration uh, in today's competitive resource market. And you have the right of series of uh, um, theoretical insights. And I'm uh, wondering that can this insight be summarized as some tips uh, on operation strategies to resourcing platforms? Uh, in a competitive market. I think uh, an, int an interesting finding is that we find that when the number of platforms is relatively small, the platforms can be more profitable in the market where the, um, where the matching function exhibits increasing return to scale. Um, generally, the right sourcing market exhibits increasing returns to scale. And um, yeah. Uh, so you mean the less competitor in the market, the more profit uh, platform can be profitable? Yes, when um, we can see this figure, um, the red, uh, the red line <clears throat> denotes decreasing return to scale and the market with decreasing return to scale. <clears throat> uh, well, um, the blue line indicates the market with constant return to scale. And the orange line indicates the market with increasing return to scale. And the solid line uh, indicates not equivalent dash line indicates social optimal. We can see that when the, mark, uh, the number of platforms is relatively small, uh, for example, one, two, three, four, five, we can see that the orange line, the Nash, the Nash equilibrium in the market with increasing return to scale, the profit is higher than the um, constant return to scale and higher than the decreasing return to scale. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, if there's no more questions, we will uh, continue our presentation. So, um, well, maybe you can uh, stop sharing the screen. 
So next uh, presenter, uh, let's welcome Mr. Si Renfeng. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, could you see the shared screen? Uh, yeah, but you may put it on the full screen. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Fair enough. Oh, okay. Uh, so, hi everyone. So, my name is Yuan Feng, and I'm from the lab of Professor Haiyang in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So today, my the, to the topic of my introduction is about uh, coordinating right sourcing and the public transport services with a reinforcement learning approach. So first, the background and the motivation. So uh, nowadays we are facing a, a very fast growing right sourcing market and uh, we have a lot of platforms such as DD, Uber, and Lyft. For example, the service of DD has covered over uh, 25 million trips and 400 cities in China. And uh, Uber can also serve over 650 uh, cities and uh, 20 countries over the world. So uh, the right sourcing platform may have many, many different operations, such as the order dispatching, right splitting operations, empty vehicle guidance, and repositioning, and et cetera. Uh, however, the most important one is the order dispatching. And uh, there are several challenges for this operation. So uh, the first challenge is that uh, uh, the market can be quite large scale. So this means the competition speed for your implementation of the order dispatching should be should, should, should be very fast. And uh, uh, also the right sourcing market is a highly dynamic system. So uh, this also increase the difficulties for the other dispatching. And the most important one uh, is that there's a repeat, repeating interaction between the decisions and the, the system states of the other dispatching. So this means the decision made on the current state uh, may have uh, influence on the future states. So this point should be considered when you design uh, the order dispatching. And then we also notice that there's a hidden interaction between right sourcing service and other transportation modes, such as public transit. So on the one hand, they are competing for customers, but uh, on the other hand, they can be also complementary to each other. For example, we have first or last mile issue. Yes, uh, as shown in this graph. So we also know that there are some benefits for closer collaboration between right sourcing and public transit industry. So for the customer, uh, they can enjoy lower trip fare and less travel time. Uh, since the trip fare of the of the public transit industry is generally lower than the is generally lower than the right sourcing uh, service. And for the right sourcing platform. The, there's a higher flexibility for them to drop off uh, some of their passengers in some areas where subsequent orders can be easily matched. And for the government, uh, they may have more passengers to choose public transit and thus have less congestion and exhaust emission for the social welfare. However, in the previous researches, uh, some of them do not consider the influence of the current decisions on the future states and uh, some of them do not consider the collaboration with public transit system. And uh, some of the previous researches are also not implemented in a coordinated and a centralized way for the order dispatching. So to overcome these challenges, we propose the our method. So before we move on, uh, let's first look at some preliminary uh, definitions. So first, for the definition of routes, we have two kinds of routes. Uh, the first one is the regular route, uh, which is just the end-to-end -end delivery. And uh, the second kind is the bundle route, where the driver will first pick up the passenger and uh, send them to their to Tucson transportation hub. So after dropping off, uh, the passengers will take the transit delivery uh, along the design route to their uh, destinations. So this is the bundle route. 
So this serving process can be naturally constructed into a Markov, Markov decision process, uh, which you can also call it NDP. So in an NDP, there are several important components. The first one is the agent, which is the driver in our study. And the state for the agent is the grid and time, time interval of each driver. And then the action can be uh, can be separated into three steps. The first step, in the first step, we select an order, and then we recommend to the to serve the order with regular route or bundle route. And if bundle route is chosen, we will select a transit station to drop off the passenger. But these three steps can be also merged into the selection of a specific route to serve for the for the order. And for the reward, uh, this is just, we just set all the revenue as the reward. Uh, since the optimization goal of our study is to maximize the platform revenue. So to solve this NDP, to find the best policy, uh, the design policy should be, uh, should be required to select some action that maximize this item, which we also denote as the Q value function where JTJ of here uh, is the summation of all the reward along all the time interval, which represents the cumulative expected return. And because although the platform is the actual agent, but the objective for its decision can be actually decomposed into the summation of all the Q value function uh, over, all the driver, over all the driver in the market. We saw actions of drivers as decision variables and some constraints on these actions. Uh, so for this decision problem, we call it the problem P1. So uh, this is the problem that we need to solve to, to find the best policy for the NDP. And we also find that the Q value function can be actually uh, described by the state value function in this formula. So uh, up to now, we only have two problems remain. The first one is how to learn a state value function that leads to the optimal decisions. And uh, the second question is that how to specify the problem one in mathematical language and solve it with some fast algorithms. So to solve these problems, uh, we design a process as shown here. So in the first step, we just collect orders together and then we will generate some routes uh, generate some routes for each order. So uh, this route can be either uh, bundle route or the regular route. And, uh, and in the step three, uh, we, we connect the routes of an order with a driver and we call this connection uh, a pair between this route and this driver. So we will use the learn value function to evaluate each pair uh, constructed uh, before. So uh, by collecting all the by collecting all the weighted pair together, we could construct a combinatorial optimization problem as shown in this graph. So by solving this problem, we could get the uh, optimal. Uh, we could get the suboptimal uh, order dispatching decision. And by implementing uh, this decision. As from here, uh, we could have some transition records and uh, we could leverage these transition records to update our state value function. And by repeating this process, the value function will generally, uh, will gradually converge to some fixed points, which leads to us the suboptimal decisions. So this is the uh, whole learning scheme for, the, for our method. Yeah, and uh, let's move on to some details. So for the route generation part, we only need to know that we set up some service quality requirements for the routes and only the routes that satisfy these requirements can be considered to be recommended to the passengers. So the, the first requirement is that only orders with original travel time that is larger than a certain value should be considered to generate bundle routes. So this is very reasonable since uh, since uh, the passenger may not accept the route if their trip is very short. And uh, the second requirement is that uh, the travel time of a bundle route should not exceed the sum of original travel time and the threshold. So this means the, the travel time of the bundle route 
should not be too large compared to the original travel time. And then the third requirement is that the, the total trip fare of the bundle route should not exceed the original order price. So this is also reasonable because uh, since you already introduced some passengers to the public transit system, although they originally want to uh, choose the right sourcing system. So if your trip fare become even larger, then this part of the passenger will not definitely, definitely will not accept such recommendation. Yes, so based on this uh, service quality requirements, we propose the general process for the raw generation at each time interval. And I will now extend this part in today's introduction. So after the raw generation, uh, the next step is to design the order dispatching. So before we move on, we could first have a quick look at the logic. So it is the decision problem P1 that we need to solve to get the, get the optimal decision of the NDP. So this problem can be constructed into the maximum weighting matching on the graph below. And based on this uh, matching problem, we could construct an IOP model for the problem one. But instead of directly solving this model, we construct another simplified IOP model, which we call P2. So it is P2 that we finally solve to get the decision of the decision problem P1. So this is the logic. So first uh, we could have a quick look at the relationship between the problem one and the graph. So recall that the problem one is to maximize the summation of the Q value function over all the drivers. And then the ATJ here can be also specified as ADIJ, representing the action for the driver J to select row I of a certain order. So such an action actually correspond, can correspond to a route driver pair, route driver pair between the driver J and the route I with the Q value function as weight of this pair. So in this way, the problem one can be thus represented by the graph on the right with the drivers and routes as nodes, route driver pairs as edges and the Q value as edge weights. Yes. And uh, by some other transformation, we could also transform the Q value function into the form like this, uh, where the RT is the immediate reward and the v, uh, v pi st next ij is the, is the state value function of the decision. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so after that, let's look at the RP model that we construct uh, based, on the, based on the this graph. So the RP model for P1 is shown here where omega ij uh, is, the, is the order revenue for driver j that, saw, that serve uh, order k along the route i. And xij is one if the driver j will serve uh, the route i and uh, otherwise it will be zero. So xij is the decision variable. And then the constraint in two uh, requires that each order, uh, each route can be only served by one driver. And uh, the constraint three requires that each driver can only serve one route. So some, uh, so some kind of special requirement is the constraint four, uh, where that we require that if one route of a specific order is served by one driver, that any other routes of this same order cannot be served by any other drivers. So this is kind of a, a strong constraint. So, but before we solve this IRP model directly, we also find a problem. That is the number of decision variable now is the M times N, where M is the number of routes. So since each order can have many candidate routes, so this number can be very large. So whether we can uh, find a way to further reduce this number, so an idea comes from an observation that if a driver is matched with one route of an order uh, in, a, in a solution of, the, of, of this IOP model, then he or her can always choose another route with larger edge weight for the same order without violation of any constraints. So based on this idea, we construct an, another IOP model, which we call P2. So here, BJK simply means the index of route with the largest edge weight in the group of routes of order K for driver J. 
So we call such route the representative route for the driver J and the order K. So omega BJ KJ is just the edge weight of the representative route. And XKJ is one if the driver J will serve the order K along its representative route. And otherwise, uh, this decision variable will be zero. So the, the constraint seven and eight is just the kind of same uh, as before. So in this way, uh, the number of parameters of this RB model P2 is now K times N, where K is the number of orders instead of routes. So the size of the decision problem is reduced. And uh, also we find that the problem now uh, can be uh, depicted as a regular by party matching, where some material combinatorial optimization method such as the cool matrix, sorry, can be applied. And the most important finding is that the, the optimal solution of the problem two, P2, can be actually constructed to an optimal solution of P1 via a fixed rule. So this means you will only need to solve the smaller problem P2 uh, in our implementation, but the optimal results just keep the same as the original problem. So this is the largest advantage of the proposed method in, in this study. So finally, uh, let's look at the state value function learning. Uh, so after implementing the decision uh, that we made, we could have some transitions in these forms where ST and ST next is the current state and the next state of the, your decision. AT is just your decision. And RT is the reward for the decision or the dispatching decision. So by using these uh, transition records, we could update our state value function in a temporal difference rule, which is first, which was first proposed by Samuel in 1959. And uh, the stopping of our learning of the state value function uh, will emerge when the state values for all the states gradually converge to some fixed points. And uh, this will lead to us the optimal suboptimal decisions of our NDP. So this is all about our methodology. And let's look at the experiments part. So we use a real world data set for our testing. Uh, we use the yellow text data released by New York TLC for July, 2015. And uh, yes, uh, we also construct our metro system uh, by using the metro system data in the New York City subway system as in the graph. So uh, we make some very brief uh, modification on the, on the station network and uh, leaving us the 148 stations. Yeah. And uh, to compare our proposed method with some baseline methods, uh, with, some, with some baselines, we propose, uh, we construct some baseline methods as shown here. So the first one is the myopic method where we dispatch orders to maximize immediate order revenue at each time interval. So the future gain of the RL is not considered and the transit system is also not integrated. And for the pickup distance based method, uh, the, the optimization goal of it is to minimize the overall pickup distance for the whole market. But the other part just uh, keep, keeps the same as the myopic method. And for the travel time based method, TDB method, uh, we integrate the transit system into the method, but uh, the RL, the reinforcement learning is not integrated. And for the learning with no transit LWNT baseline, we use the RL, uh, the reinforcement learning method, but the transit system is not integrated. So in addition, we also set up uh, three cases with different densities of drivers and the orders to comprehensively compare our method with the baseline methods. Uh, so here, these are some learned value functions for our method. Yes, I will just pass it very quickly. And for the testing, uh, the most important measurements our of our testing is the platform revenue. And in addition to this, we also set up five measurements. The first one is the utilization rate of subway, uh, which we call URS. And FRLO is the fulfillment rate of the long orders under the proposed, under the method. 
and the FIMO is the fulfillment rate of median orders, and the FISO is for the short orders, and the FRAO is for the order orders. So the results are shown below. So this is a summarization of the results. So compared to the non-RL and the no transit integrated baselines, our method can basically outperform them in all the measurements. And compared to the non-RL by transit integrated baseline, the proposed method can outperform it uh, by 6% to 11% in platform revenue of the three cases. And compared to the non-transit integrated RL baseline, the most important improvement is that the utilization rate of the subway can be improved by 30%, 28%, and 24% for the three cases. So this means we could have a win-win situation for both the subway system and the rail sourcing system. So finally, the conclusions and future work. Uh, so this work studies the order dispatching problem for rail sourcing operation with public transit system integrity. Uh, so we utilize a reinforcement learning scheme to obtain the stable function for drivers over space and over time, and uh, which is there used to represent the future rewards. And we also propose an RLP model, uh, which is then uh, developers simplified and solved to decide the order dispatching uh, with the mix of regular and bundle routes based on both the immediate reward and the future rewards. And uh, by evalu evaluation on the real right sourcing data set of Manhattan, the proposed method uh, is shown to outperform the baseline methods. So maybe in the future work, uh, first, we may, uh, we may test some other advanced reinforcement learning method uh, to, be, to, to apply them uh, to improve the effectiveness of the framework uh, in this study. And, uh, uh, we also noticed that the current method is majorly designed for the operation of right sourcing platform under the existing public transit systems. So maybe an integrated design of operation policies for both platform and the public transit system can be implied to further improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of the whole system. And uh, personally, I think uh, this may be a very intriguing intriguing and an interesting way to improve the current framework. Since uh, many, many transportation hub uh, has, has, how to say, has tried to build uh, some information center to, in, to comprehensively uh, design the operations of different uh, transportation modes. So I think uh, this, this trend may be very interesting and potential. So uh, yes, this is my all about my today's introduction. Sorry, and many thanks for uh, your audience. Yeah. Oh wow! Well, um, thank you so much for your informative presentation. Uh, well, I think this topic can help uh, maintain the sustainable development of the entire transportation system. So uh, if no questions from the audience, I will uh, pose a simple question. Uh, can you go back to the, your settings of uh, like the service quality requirement? Uh, actually, you add up the uh, original travel time and uh, threshold L2 as a, a requirement for the travel time of bundle route, right? Yes. So uh, in your experiment, uh, what's the value of L2? Maybe just uh, five minutes. Okay. Uh, so um, maybe I think when you increase the uh, L2, um, the perform will be uh, better. But, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, but, but uh, actually you did not incorporate the acceptance of uh, passengers, right? Uh, acceptance of passengers, you mean? Uh, uh, I, I mean that uh, passengers would prefer to travel in a short time, right? Oh, yes. Uh, in the, yes, so, so these experiments uh, shown, shown in these slides is not complete. So in the, in the paper, yes, in the in the formal paper, 
uh, we do some sensitivity sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. to consider the passengers' acceptance uh, about the bundle route that is recommended to them. So the the passenger, uh, so by saying that, I mean the passenger may reject if the if the if the travel time of the bundle route is too long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and. Uh... Yes, yes. Uh, so we yeah, made some. Yes, we made some related. Maybe you can consider to uh, offer some offer a proper subsidy to the passengers assigned to a bundle route. Maybe. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's one of solutions, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, we have our third speaker, Miss Shu Qingwei. Uh, her topic is calibration and validation of matching functions for rice sourcing markets. So, uh, yes, yeah, you can share your screen. Okay. Okay, then I will start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Shu Qing. Today, my topic is calibration and validation of matching functions for right sourcing markets. In a word, in right sourcing markets uh, with different supply and demand, we figure out the best fit matching functions for different metrics. Right sourcing services have developed a lot since their emergence, the core of which is matching functions. Previous studies have developed many matching functions. However, less is known about the applicability and performance of these matching functions. To address this issue, we established a simulator um, to simulate a total of 420 scenarios of right sourcing markets under different combination of supply and demand. The key performance metrics, uh, including the matching rate, matching time, pickup time and total waiting time are utilized to test and compare several widely used matching functions on the various market scenarios. We use the simulator to generate the real market metrics for any input of demand rate Q and free size N. After each market scenario in the simulator reaches uh, equilibrium, the true value of the key market, uh, market metrics are recorded. Then we calculate the key market metrics of each market scenarios on the basis of different matching functions. Then we can get the best fit models by comparing these two. Uh, MAP is used to evaluate and compare different models. Now we will briefly introduce the seven matching functions first. The right sourcing market is a typical two-side market consists of two groups of participants, passengers and drivers. The right sourcing model usually contains three components, including passenger demand function, uh, driver supply function, and the matching function. The matching function at the core of this model describes the matching frictions between supply and demand. In general, the matching function is a group of nonlinear simultaneous equations that take passengers demand Q and fleet size N as an input and outputs the matching time and pickup time. This theta represents the platform's matching strategy. Next, we will briefly introduce the basic ideas of matching functions and see how do we do they get the metrics we mentioned before. Perfect matching is an intuitive model and characterizes a market with or without matching friction. It assumes that both customers and drivers do not wait, so the waiting time and pickup time are all zero and the matching rate is calculated as below. In Cope Douglas production function, uh, the, the matching rate is governed by the size of two poles of uh, idle, drive, idle vehicles and uh, waiting passengers. More waiting passengers and idle drivers will lead to a larger matching rate. Uh, A, F1, F2 are all parameters. Combine these three formulas, we can get the metrics. 
In the MM1Q model, we assume the arrival of the passengers follow a poison distribution, and the whole supply side is regarded as one service desk whose service rate is calculated by N over T. This parameter K stands for the maximum Q length, uh, which means that when the Q length reaches K, the passengers will live directly instead of joining this queue. MMM model regards each driver as a service desk uh, with a service rate of one over T and the platform provides a total of N service desks. First come first serve model is another simple but widely ado adopted model. Uh, the matching rule is that when the passenger raises a ride request, he will be immediately assigned the closest driver based on a first come first serve rule. We further assume the average pickup time is a function of the number of idle vehicles. Then we can get a matrix by solving the system of equations. The batch matching model assumes the platform adopts a batch matching mechanism in which waiting, waiting passengers and idle drivers are accumulated in a matching pool during one matching interval and get matched at the end of this interval. In each matching time interval, the platform matches all mutually closest pair of drivers and passengers. This is the summary of different models. This figure shows how the simulator simulates the right sourcing market. Uh, the top half presents the supply side, namely the behavior of drivers. The bottom half stands for the demand side and presents the behavior of passengers. Uh, there are four main stages in each time interval order generation, matching process, cross and create, and update the setup of drivers and passengers. Without loss of generality, we use a square as our research area. Uh, the experimental setup is as, as follows. Passengers' are average matching time is used as a condition for judging whether a stationary market equilibrium is reached. Um, it will be reca recalculated at the end of each time interval. When it converges, uh, this market is regarded as reaching an equilibrium. To facilitate the analysis, uh, we divide the market into three segments, oversupply market balance and uh, undersupply markets. The horizontal axis stands for demand, while the vertical one stands for the fleet size. Balance the markets refer to the markets where the supply is comparable to the demand, namely the passenger arrival rate Q is between 70% uh, and to 100% uh, of the service capacity N over T. Correspondingly, the Oversupplied markets and the undersupplied markets are defined. In the undersupplied markets, there must be some passengers left unmatched, and the pass uh, and the system fails to reach a stable equilibrium. Uh, therefore, here we mainly focus on the first two markets uh, above the red line. This figure shows the result of the best fit models for calculating the matching rate. Each point here uh, represents an equilibrium market under a combination of some supply and demand. The color of each point denotes the best fit model and the size of each point denotes the MAPE of the best fit models. A larger size means the best fit model has a larger error. It shows that the perfect matching model and the MM1K queuing model fits the real data well in most markets, and their results are very close to each other. Um, it is worth noting that in oversupply markets, all the examined model except for the MM1K queuing model assumes that every arrival passenger gets served finally and the estimated the matching rate by Q, which is given as an input. 
So this model have the same result as the perfect matching model, uh, but are not exhibited here for the context of the figure. The right part are the sectional drawings. Uh, when the supply is sufficient, this blue area, uh, all requests will be served and the matching rate equals to the arrival rate of the orders. So in oversupply market, all models can estimate the matching rate with a small error. However, when the demand continues to increase, only MM1K model takes the passengers' departures into consideration. So it has a lower error. For matching time, Cobb Douglas production function is suitable for the balanced markets and the batch matching model is suitable for the oversupplied markets. When the market close to the red line, uh, the queuing model, especially the MM1 queuing model, have better performance. In the oversupplied uh, over markets, this blue area, the matching time is close to zero. Uh, and all models, even those that just regard matching time as zero, have small absolute errors. Uh, mat batch matching is the most accurate model in this market because it is the only one that takes the ma matching time interval into consideration. In batch matching, when the supply is sufficient, the matching time will approximate the minimum uh, matching time interval, which leads to a small error. In this gray area, balanced markets, uh, the matching time is relatively large and hard to estimate. Cobb Douglas production function is very close to the true value in terms of both trend and the absolute uh, value because it describes the relationship uh, among four key variables very well from a macroscope point of view. However, these two models are unsolvable uh, when the market is close to this red line. But MM1 KQ model, which considers the passenger departures, has a larger applied range and it is more consistent with the market. In the context of pickup time estimation, overall first come first serve model is suitable for the oversupply market and part of the balanced uh, balanced markets with a larger supply. Batch matching is suitable for balanced markets. It is worth noting that when the market is close to this red line, all models are unable to well approximate the pickup time. In this case, even the best of it model shows here, uh, which re simply regards the matching time as zero, has have a one person MAP error. First come, first serve model and batch matching model are suitable to calculate the pickup time because they well characterize drivers' idle pickup and in trip phases. Further, batch matching considers both pickup time and matching time. Well, first come, first serve focus on characterizing the pickup time and regards the matching time as zero. So, this explains why. First come, first serve has a better performance in the pickup time estimation. So the waiting time is the sum of matching time and pickup time. Under the, um, uh, under the oversupply markets, orders are matched quickly and the pickup time governs the total waiting time. As we mentioned before, first come, first serve has a good performance in estimating average pickup time. As a result, it also has better performance in estimating the total waiting time in oversupply markets. When the supply becomes insufficient, uh, the total waiting time is governed by both matching time and the pickup time. When the market is close to this red line, all models are unable to well approximate the pickup time and the, the queuing model well characterize the matching time. So the queuing models perform better. This table summarizes the best fit models in different markets. In order to test the application results of models on a real world data set, we use the order data from Manhattan to test the models. 
different from previous study area that is a square. This research area is a rectangle, which is shown this block, a black box. Um, moreover, based on the local conditions in Manhattan, the vehicle speed is reduced. Manhattan is a single market. However, in order to generate a whole two-dimensional evaluation result and compare it with the original simulation result, we need to sampling orders to adjust the demand and set different fleet sets to adjust the supply. The simulation result is as below. We can see that the trend is consistent with the previous experiment. So that's all I have today. Oh, well, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, no further questions from the audience. Uh, well, okay. So I think your work provides a valuable reference on the, the best phase market for, uh, for a variety of wide adopted matching functions. Uh, well, I found that um, in your experiment, none of the existing matching functions can be used in the market with demand or the supply, right? Uh, so uh, it means you, you, you haven't tested some more uh, matching functions or uh, could you explain the, the, the reason behind? Uh, you mean the undersupply market? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, because um, for the current models, they, uh, they always, they have a lot of assumptions. And the most of the models assumes that the market is equilibrium. Uh, however, in the undersupply market, the market is not equilibrium. So most of the models don't have a um, feasible solution here. Oh, okay. Um, you mean in this market, uh, passengers will uh, wait impatiently and cancel the cancel the uh, order, right? Yes. Uh, but um, I think in the Cobb Douglas uh matching function, um, all the demand will be served. Uh, well, the difference is the uh, waiting time of these passengers. So, uh, I think maybe a Maybe it only extends the waiting time of passengers, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Cobb Douglas also assumed that all passenger will get uh will get served, but uh, you know, in this market, not all the passengers get served. So, uh, actually, if you if you just uh, if you just uh, put these three formulas together and uh, you, you will find there is no feasible solution. Okay, so maybe- yeah, Because uh, this, uh, yeah. this N is quite uh, uh, okay. close right. to this QT. Got it. So maybe uh, a more generalized matching function should be developed to, uh, to fit this market, right? Uh, yes, but actually, in the real world, uh, if the if the customer quits the queue and it, they will choose another travel mode, so uh, they may not be counted to the arrival rate of orders. Okay. However, this is a simulation, and the, the the arrival rate of orders is fixed. So we we don't we did not taking to consider other variables. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, well, last but not least, uh, let's welcome the fourth speaker, uh, Ms. Yu Han Liu. Um, well, uh, her topic today is uh, optimal incentive strategy for the retention of impatient passengers in wide sourcing uh, markets. 
So, uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you share my screen? Okay, can you hear the, uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, um, you can start. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Yuhan Liu, and today my research topic uh, is uh, the discount strategy for ret retention of impatient passengers. And I'd like to introduce my uh, topic in the following four parts, the so introduction, model, numerical results, and uh, conclusion. First, uh, let's go to the background. With the expansion in red sourcing market, queuing becomes a common occurrence, especially during the peak hours. The queue in red sourcing market is invisible. Thus, the information symmetry of queue increases the abandonment of the impatient passengers. This kind of increasing demand also brings several uh, queue-related concerns. The invisible queue uh, exaggerates the abandonment and damage the platform interests. And for a long-term perspective, the passenger satisfac satisfaction with the platform service decline, which is detrimental to the platform uh, sustainable development. So uh, to, so, uh, to solve these two problems, we consider two management methods to improve the queuing experience uh, of passengers and their long-term stickiness to the platform. Uh, the first is delay announcement and the second is discount strategy. As shown in the figure, the delay announcement is provided during the waiting for dispatching per Precise as long as a passenger joins the queue and updates on the regular frequency. The delay announcements normally inform the number of people waiting ahead or a more intuitive indicator, the estimated waiting time for being served or both. However, providing delay announcement alone is insufficient to optimize the waiting experience for users and the platform revenue. We also provide the discount strategy, especially uh, specifically offering a discount on a trip fire for users who satisfy the discount uh, criterion. And the strategy contains three factors, which are uh, uh, implementation condition, the discount size, and the discount threshold. The advantage of these two management strategies are uh, for providing the delay announcements, uh, it can reduce the information symmetry of blind passengers. And uh, for offering a waiting discount strategy during the post pay period, first, it can uh, increase the passengers' willingness to wait without diminishing their benefits. And for platform, it can increase its revenue. For, all, uh, for the drivers uh, with more order being served, drivers can increase their earnings and reduce their idle time as well as the cross uh, distance. In this paper, we aim at maximizing the profit of the platform by optimizing the discount strategy in red sourcing queue with delay announcements. We describe the queuing process of passengers by a, a delay reaction system where the delay announcements, passengers' behavior, and the proposed discount scheme all interact with each other as shown in this figure. Uh, the platform will provide the estimated waiting time to the passengers, which will influence the passengers' utility and their abandoned probabilities. And all passengers' behavior will in turn influence the platform, uh, will influence the platform to improve, to, to give the uh, estimated waiting time. And the discount strategy uh, work as an exogenous variable to this uh, system. Okay, let's move to the model part. We first uh, Use, uh, we first show our queuing process and some properties. The queuing process is the use, uh, use a Markov chain, and the lambda is a revel rate, theta is a service rate, and uh, we assume passengers are impatient. Their patience time particular uh, follows an exponential distribution uh, with rate r. 
it is worth to note that we only analyze the queuing process uh, from the discount uh, strategy is implemented to the queue disappearing, which is TS to TED in this figure. In this process, the capacity of the queue is limited because the uh, maximum queue loss is known. So we cannot use the stable state to describe some queue properties. Thus, we introduce a queue loss function, which is denoted by xt. And uh, we use this queue function to deduce some properties. The queue loss function of t in a tiny interval can transfer to three different states with corresponding probabilities. So we can get a closed form of a uh, loss function where uh, in which C1 is, the, is determined by the initial Q loss I uh, at, at the starting point of the Q. And the Q disappearing time can be calculated by, the, uh, by when the Q loss function is equal to zero and is denoted as TE. With the Q-loss function, we can get some uh, properties during this time. For, uh, the first is the average Q-loss, and the second is the probability that a passenger join at the state N, uh, which is denoted as PN. PN is calculated by the ratio of the number of people with initial position N to the total number of people in the Q uh, through the specific period. Then we move to the second part of our model, the interaction between the passenger's reaction and updated delay announcements. Passengers make a reaction based on the random utility function, which compose of deterministic utility phi and the random term epsilon, including the uh, external factors that influence the passenger's preference. The deterministic utility phi is based on four parameters, the trip valuation, the trip fire, the value of time, as well as the estimated waiting time for a passenger in position N. We assume that one, ab uh, one passenger abandoned when his or her utility is equal, is equal to zero. Thus, the abandoned probability can be formulated as uh, QN. Recall that a passenger make a decision based on the estimated waiting time DN. So we provide a method to calculate the estimated, estimated waiting time for each position. For each passenger, the precise for being served can be regarded as a pure dice precise, where S is the number of the service, theta is a uh, service rate and uh, the time until a new arrival is scheduled to begin the service is equal to the time it takes for passengers ahead of him to leave the queue, uh, either abandon or enter the service, plus the time necessary to complete the service. So the estimated waiting time for position N can be formulated as a hyper exponential distribution whose uh, CDF and PDF is shown in this figure, uh, is shown in these slides. Up to now, the utility function is derived, but the reneging rate of the patient's time distribution is still unknown. It is worth to know that the passenger's patient's time is related to her endogenous reaction. Thus, we use a method to gather reneging rate based on the abandoned probability from the utility function. As shown in the slides, we use the mean rate of abandoning customers to link passengers' reaction and their patient's time distribution. Thus, we can use a fixed point method to determine the uh, reneging rate during the specific period. Then we move to the third part, the discount strategy in our model. To encourage the passenger stay in line patiently, the platform uh, expects to increase their rewards for being served by a discounted trip fire. Recall that in the complete queuing system, the discount strategy work as a 
uh, exogenous variable, which affects the passenger's utility by changing their trip fire. The discount strategy considers three factors, the implementation condition or the initial queue loss, which determine the in implement implementing time for discount strategy. The discount size, which determine how much, it, how much the discount is given, is in the range of zero to one. The smaller this value, the less passenger need to pay. And the discount threshold determine how long one must wait before receiving the discount. The utility function thus can be reformulated as phi n, in which capital phi n in indicates the expected probability that the passenger can receive the discount when she is in the nth position of the queue. This probability is essential since not all passengers can uh, are eligible for enjoying the uh, delay discount. Recall the uh, interpretation of the discount strategy. If her initial estimated waiting time exceeds the threshold, she will be informed uh, when she enters the queue that she will enjoy a fixed discount as long as she waits until being served. Consequently, passengers in different initial positions have varied, have varied chance of receiving the discount, and the expected probability of getting the discount depends on the passenger's various initial state under the conditions that passenger joins the queue in state N or later. Then uh, taking the discount size, discount threshold, as well as the initial queue loss as a decision variable, we propose an optimization model with objective, with objective to maximize the platform revenue. The first time in our OBG is the increasing benefit of the platform earning with strategy. The second term is the discount cost by the platform. It is determined by the number of passengers who receive the discount and actually enjoy it. Gamma is a discount uh, is a constant uh, commission rate determined by the platform, and uh, SN is the probability of a passenger can survive until being served conditional. Uh, she joined at state N. The profit of the platform is from the increasing retention of passengers by discount strategy. In this figure, uh, the queue disappearing time is extended from TEN to TED. Uh, this gap is the number of the, uh, in this gap, the number of the individuals served uh, is related to the arrival rate and the service rate respectively. Thus, it's called the distinction in the number of people served. More intuitively, the effect of the discount strategy is to encourage the waiting, the passengers waiting and maximizing the utilization of the available supply. Then we move to the result part. Uh, there are three figures. Uh, the three figures are the result of uh, increasing profit of discount size and discount threshold combination in different initial queue lines. And the result shows that rather than offering a little discount to a large number of passengers, it is more beneficial to offer more, uh, offer a more attractive discount to those who are more inclined to abandon or put it another way to those who wait for a longer amount of time. Then we do some uh, sensitive analysis. First, we consider uh, the parameter related with the market environment, which contains the arrival rate and service rate. The result shows that uh, the usage of this counting strategy is only effective if the service arrival rate ratio falls within a specific range. Exceeding or falling below this range would only cause a cost to the platform. Second, we consider the parameters related with the passenger's attributes, which contains the trip valuation and the value of time. The result shows that the discount strategy is effective when passengers abandon probability for in a particular range. And a resource in platform can be benefit, 
from the discount strategy in the market or period with both relative high or low uh, representative trip valuation and the value of time of passengers. Last, we discussed the parameters related with the platform strategy, uh, which are the commission rate and the trip fire. The result shows the increasing profit of the platform is positive with the commission rate and the uh, optimal profit of the trip fire needs to trade off between the number of abandonments and the platform revenue. Uh, then we will go to the conclusion part. The discount, uh, besides the delay announcement, we propose a discount strategy to increase the platform revenue, and we propose a delay reaction system to describe the interaction between the delay announcements and the passenger's reaction and incorporate the discount strategy into the system as a exogenous variables. This study fails the gap of giving discount strategy for passengers' behaviors and obtain results with heuristic implications of the for the platform designing strategies. Okay, that's all, and uh, welcome to the question. Um, oh, okay, thank you for your enlightening presentation. So I will uh, ask a simple question. I know that uh, you consider passengers with a uh, homogeneous value of time and uh, trip fare, right? Yeah. Uh, um, however, I think that the uh, heterogeneity may uh, make a great difference on your result on the uh, queuing performance. So how do you capture the heterogeneity in the queue? Uh, well, in our uh, in our model that uh, uh, heterogeneity is reflect on that the passengers can uh, join the queue in different uh, initial state and uh, uh, their different initial position shows the heterogeneity of the passengers that they will uh, have different uh, uh, delay announcements uh, so that they will have different abandoned probability during the queuing. Uh, so it only related to the position of a, a, a passenger in the queue, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so any uh, passengers in the, at the same position will uh, make the same decision under the condition of the, like the same delay announcement. Uh, yes, because we think that uh, uh, passengers are uh, region, uh, regional passengers, so they do not consider their self waiting time. In the same, uh, in the same positions, uh, their uh, delay announcement is only related with how long they still need to wait, but not their self waiting time. So it's only with their, it's only related with their position. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, we come to the end of the session and uh, thank you to all of uh, our presenters for your uh, wonderful presentation and discussion. So uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.